what to do. So I don't think the deficiency is really on that side. <laughs> there, there is enough leaders that are far more than facilitators that are going to be strong leaders and say, no, this is right, this is wrong. And so, you know, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get, we're going to have to be able to start talking about some real strong followers. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We're going to have to start really being able to talk about some real obedient troops because, you know, I was raised during a period of time that everybody was just basically screaming out and hollering that, you know, the leaders weren't being the leaders that they needed to be or whatever. And, you know, if you can't rule your own house, how can you rule the house of God? Well, I rule my house and I'm trying my very best to rule the house of God as well. And I know a lot of other ministries that are the same way. Now what we're going to have to do is step in to the responsibility get it really where it's supposed to be squarely upon the shoulders of God's people. So folks will begin to deal with whether or not they are being obedient. And tonight, I'm going to spend some time, I just want to, I just I feel it's just so strong in my spirit about help, helping people get assigned on what it is that you're going to do. Because, you know, when you do an honest evaluation of the New Testament, the reality of it is his father has told us to forsake everything and come follow him. The reality of the call of God is that everything about our life is supposed to be about our heavenly purpose, about who we've been made as the ambassadors of God in Christ's stead with the authority of the sons of the living God. And my, if God's people could just really begin to grab a hold of the authority that they have received in Him and begin to move in it instead of just abdicating and instead of just going half measures. Father wants us to be filled with zeal. He wants us to be filled with passion about this business, not 10% zeal, 15%. I gave 20% of my finances to the kingdom. That's nothing. That's nothing. You gave more than that to Uncle Sam. You don't understand. And somebody says, well, you know, I'm just trying to figure it all out. You know, I want to do more. Well, you could do more if you didn't take thought for your food, what you're going to eat, and for your clothes, what you're going to wear. If you would turn it around and say, rather, I'm talking about, think about how I'm going to be involved in reaching the lost. How am I, there are, listen, listen to me. Don't give me, I want, to, I want the floodlight of heaven to shine upon your soul, the people that are in this place, the people that are watching by web. It, it's nonsense to say that you d don't have a harvest field to labor in because the fields are white in the harvest. And that literally, Jesus is not talking about a single generation. He's not talking about a, partic a particular geographical location. He's actually referring to this time period that we live in, this, this what we would call the age of grace or the New Testament time period, the New Covenant time period. I mean, my goodness, if people would just begin to take a heart of saying, look, you know what, I, I, I'm going to go and I'm going to buy a bus or a van and I'm going to give myself to going and picking up children uh, in, in downtown, you're going to have a van full. You're going to have a van full. Give me a break. You know, people are just walking around, they, they're like a little kitty cat, licking on themselves all the time. You know what I'm saying? Just taking care of themselves, licking on themselves. Are you with me? Yeah. Can I get crude for a minute? Okay, I just want to try to point, paint a picture of this thing. And I'm telling you, and, and then, and then the, the, the receptors are all built around what you can taste and sense about yourself. It isn't about that. It, it, it's about how do we lay down our life for a lost and dying world. Listen, we have a strategy to go and reach nations. We are somehow, I don't think people get this. We have implemented, we're not talking about it, thinking about it, it's not theoretical. We have implemented a strategy to reach the nations. I'm telling you, we've implemented it already. We believe that God has given us an ability to now focus on unreached people groups and go after resources within those countries to raise them up for the single purpose of reaching loss. And, and here's what we're going to be teaching them. Here's what we're teaching them already. Here's what we've already started planning and discussing and strategizing with the church leaders in these nations. 
where we're going to equip them to be a community, to be able to produce finances as a community and at the exact same time preach the gospel. It's the, we, here's what we do in America. We have a job and we have a business and on the side every once in a while we preach the gospel. It's not about the, it's not about the gospel. You don't walk into your business with Jesus saves underneath it. Are you listening to me? Yes. You don't walk into your business and, and find that everywhere you look, the name of Jesus Christ is being declared. It's not true. You walk into your business and if you're a mechanic shop, it's mechanic stuff all over the place. If you're, you know, whatever business you're in, it's just plastering the wall and you're there with your, with your, te with your shirt on that says who you are as a company. And that's what you represent. How many hours in a day? Are you listening to me? We need to turn this thing around, man. We've been assimilated into a worldly system and we labor and work for it. And then on top of that, then we've been indebted with all of these various different financial obligations. And we're saying that we're full time in the ministry and that we're just talking to Jesus all day long. That's nonsense. It's nonsense, and I want the floodlight of heaven to shine upon God's people's soul so they can look at the reality of what's going on now. The Lord has called us to a full-time place of representing Him. Not a single person is excluded. And I believe that the Lord wants to give us divine ideas on how to implement these things. But if you just, if I just took you, if for the sake of trying to get this point across, I mean, listen to me, dear people, if any of you think that for some reason you can't quit your job because if you do, the church won't be supported, forget about that. We'll be just fine. There are many people that need to reset their life because their life is not appropriately being run Okay, it's the inch. Look, your life is being run for yourself, for self-interest. Look at your checkbook. Just look at it quantitatively. Measure. I mean, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. Okay, people talk about this thing, that thing, and the other thing. To Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and everybody else of the founding fathers, they were dealing with things that were measurable. They were dealing with things that were in their face every day, that they were up against every day. And so it wasn't something that they couldn't prove. It was very provable and everybody, didn't know one need to be convinced of it. Everybody knew it. Are you with me? I want you to stop dealing with a conspiracy theory and a fantasy about your life. I want you to look at your life. I want you to look at the measure of your life. I want you to look at it in terms, number one, I want you to monetize it. I want you to look at the time you spend laboring to earn the money that you spend, which literally 80 to 90% of it goes to you. I want you to deal with this. It goes to you. Oh, justifiably so. Bless your heart. Okay, because it's your mortgage, it's your car payments, it's your retirement fund, it's your vacation, it's your clothes, it's your food. It's the whole list of justifiable things that we're all trying to look good for Jesus. The Lord never said, I want you to look good for me. He didn't say that. He said, I want you to go and reach the lost for me. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're stuck. We don't know how to do that because we live in a social structure, in a system, in a society that has placed great emphasis on us, you know, being very serious about our careers, very serious about our own personal development, very serious about our physical health and well-being and position in society. I pray you get real serious about your souls. <laughs> I pray you get real serious about obeying God. Come on now. Come on now. Listen, I, can, I know you can stand in heaven, uh, 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 in heaven before the Lord and tell the Lord. Of course, he's going to be telling you. You're not going to be telling him anyways. You can be telling the Lord right now personally, well, Lord, we're just holding uh, pastor's hands up. And then he knows really whether that's true or not. And if that's true, well, praise God and, and understand that we need to, you know, you need to move into the realm of faith because we need to do this a little bit faster, okay? Uh, we got a, we, there's a lot of work to do and there's a few hands doing it. I just want you to consider you personally getting a plan where you can personally reach the unreached people groups, where you can personally impact the lost, where you can personally find a way 
where that ultimately all of the, that need, for example, that, re, that, that exists within the framework of an unreached people group, let's just say like Nepal, just take that example, which is a huge degree of poverty as well as spiritual need. How are we going to get that as well, as well as changing the mindset of the people? How are you going to be able to do that? By what tools, by what strategy, by what means? Then, once you now have a heavenly vision to go do what God told you to do, how are you going to execute on that? Because I've recently been hearing, you know, that all these pastors and all these ministers, they want uh, uh, us, you know, and the lay people, to rally around their vision. Well, get your vision. What is your vision, sweetheart? What is your vision that you, that you all upset that you having to rally around somebody else's vision? Reality of it is, it's a void. There is no vision. There is no implementation. How are you going to do that? By what resources are you going to ultimately accomplish that? You know, I was, t I was telling my wife last night, I said, one man, one man, his name was Meyer. I forgive me, Mayer. One man named Mayer who was, who was living in a time, listen to me, living in a time where he was persecuted above all other peoples. He had no right to own land. He had no right to pursue a trade. He, had no, he had, was deprived of all the basic rights. Listen to me. Deprived of all basic rights. Okay? And then had to live on a street called Jew Street, which at night, as soon as it was as soon as the sun set, they would chain him up. Take care of the baby. Or give him to me, I'll take care of him. When they, at night they would chain him up. He just needs a little prayer there. At, at night they would chain up the street, and then at dawn they would unchain the street. Mayor. And Mayor had one idea, and that was to bring change to the way that the world perceived Jews. And within, within two generations, really within one generation, he took over the entire banking system of the world. His name was Mayor Rothschild. And his son Nathan and Jacob and Solomon. I mean, I could go through the list. What, one man, one man, one man, one man can get a creative idea. Okay, can get a creative idea who's oppressed no, not, not a run down the middle, oppressed, a persecuted minority, deprived of, of, of the rights that you and I enjoy every day, didn't have those rights, was, was taxed more than anybody else was taxed, taxed double what everybody else was taxed. That's the way it was in Frankfurt, Prussia in that day. And I, and I look at this, and I, and I, and I, I, go, I like walking back through history, and I'm, I like looking at people, especially in a secular world, that change society. They change society. And I'm like, what's, what pops? What do I got to do? I'm not pointing my finger at anybody else, because I'm gonna, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. I, I mean, I, you know, I don't have five sons. You know, I got two and two daughters. And... Uh, but you know what? How, how do we become passionate and zealous? They were just passionate and zealous about their own persons, about their own identity, about their own people. They were, they were pressured into be passionate, pressured into be zealous and passionate because they were so persecuted. They were a persecuted minority that were so hated. Okay? I mean, look, the Jews have been through what no single people group has ever been through. Come on. There's nobody who's been hunted to the ends of the earth for, you know, for so many years, for 2,600 years. Give me a break. Nobody's been through that. And then, you know, here we are now with divine power. Come on now. Divine ability, divine authority. Give me a break. God has given to us. We got something wrong. I mean, I'm just, come on. I can, look, I, I, I like to sit back and evaluate things and say, okay, Here's where we've gone. Here's where we're going. Here's what we've done. Here's what we've done it with. Here's what we should have been able to do. And go, well, what's wrong? And somebody said, where do you get what you should be able to do? I quantitate, I quantitate that off of the measure of what God said we could do. You know, why is it that we're stuck? Why is it that we can't think like, 
like guys like Mayer thought. Why can't we think that way? Why do we really truly believe that we're good at justifying our state and being comfortable with what we're done? Why? We shouldn't. Why are we so self-absorbed? Why, why do we look to a system that is around us, whether, whether it's an academic system, a governmental system, um, a, a financial system, to give us permission? Why do we look to a social system to try to say, who am I? What am I supposed to do? What am I allowed to do? Oh, you can't do that. Okay, I can't do that. I'm going to obey. I'm going to be my, your servant. Well, the Lord's actually told us, you aren't supposed to be being ruined by the rudiments of this world, by the philosophies of men and by their deceits. You're not supposed to, you're, 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 it's messing everything up. Now, what I've got to do is on self-evaluation, I've got to stand back and I've got to say, wait a minute, how much am I doing that? How much am I allowing? I'm, I'm going to make you totally uncomfortable with yourself. That's my job. Okay? And I want you to become so uncomfortable with yourself that you go, forget self, and I'm going to do it with God, what God said to do. Okay, I'm going to step out beyond myself because we live in a prison of self-interest. We live in a prison of human ability. We say, well, I can't do that. Oh, it's too hard for me to do that. Or what does he expect of us? And, or whatever it is that our little one-liners are to ourselves and to the people that are around us that, are, that supposedly gives us permission to continue to do what's wrong. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what you want to do is you want to get rid of your one-liners that give you permission to continue to do what's wrong. We want you now to get a hold of the one lighters of the word of God and, and continue, command yourself to do what's right. Huh? Because, you know, everybody can become overwhelmed. And especially about the time you're about to break through into a realm, you know, <laughs> prosperity is to cut through those things that stand between you and the, and the success. To cut through it. <laughs> to bust through it. That's what the Hebrew word literally means, to cut through it, to bust through something, to, to, to overcome. It's really to overcome it. You know, there's so many different ways to describe it, to overcome like, hindrance, to gain that success. And then, and then how do we do that? Are we going to do it by the arm of flesh or are we going to truly do it by the Spirit? Well, if we're going to do it by the Spirit, no, everybody goes, yes, praise God, hallelujah, we're going to do it by the Spirit. Okay, good, bless your heart. Now, the first part of that is obeying God's Word, absolutely. Now, that's the hard part, because we're all like, woo, pray, woo, by the, praise God by the Spirit. But then, when that church service is over, and we've all finished dancing around or whatever it is we've been doing, you know, now practicality comes. Now obedience comes. Now abandonment comes. Now going beyond human ability comes. Now reaching beyond. The mayor had no right to become wealthy. You and I in the American system have the right and privilege to be as wealthy as we can possibly attain unto. And we don't do it, but he did it. And so many other people did it as well. Without the power of God, by the way. Without a heavenly purpose and without a heavenly vision. Could you imagine what would have happened if some of God's people who are, were all about the kingdom of God and advancing the kingdom of God did what, did what Mayer did? Huh? And, his, and, and that person's five sons became, four, five sons became the richest people on the face of the earth and literally be, owned the financial banking system of the world. Give me a break. I think Jesus would have already come back. I think we would have had, I think we've been pretty much done now. You know why? Because we would have gone in and fed all the poor and brought them to Jesus. We would have gone in and housed all the orphans and brought them to Jesus. We would have gone in and take, uh, taken uh, the, uh, care of the old folks. You know how many, how many kids, take the layers, the, uh, the demographics, how many children, okay, under the age of 12, and how many Old people over the age of 60. I'm not going to say 50, but when you get in third world country and you're 60 years old, you're getting old, okay? Because of just the kind of environment that they've had to live in, situations that they have, to have gone through, okay? You take that and you're looking at a huge populace of the people and the unreached people groups that are saying, take care of me, somebody help me. You come and take care of them, you help them. You've won them to Jesus already. Goodness gracious. The harvest has come in. The rest are fruit for the picking for later. 
You know, it's the low-lying fruit. You know, there's so many people always saying, you know, don't go, you know, in the corporate mentality, don't go get a ladder. Don't go buy a ladder to pick all the high fruit. When the whole place is filled with fruit, you can just reach out there and pick off and put in your basket so quickly that you don't even have time to get it all. Right? People, this is, we got to get a heavenly vision here. We're stuck. We're trying to get to church. It's like Keith Green said, Jesus rode from the dead and God's people can't even get out of bed. And it's so true. It's like Reinhardt's daddy. And Reinhardt said, there's one thing God won't do is move you from your couch. There's got to be an activation of faith. I'm crying, oh, God's in prosperity now. And I'm talking about soul prosperity because soul prosperity is going to result in the ability for us to have everything else that we need to get the job done. I'm going to get it done. Okay? I'm going to get it done. I'm not, I'm not going to stand... I'm not going to stand in the company of the redeemed and it be measured by my checkbook, by my time. Because I wanted to get real practical with you. You want to know what's going to happen when you stand in before the Lord? Go look at your checkbook and go look at your time. Because that's the measure. Because that tells you something that a lot of people don't want to hear. Okay? They don't want to quantify it. They want to keep it in the esoteric. They want to keep it in the purely unseen spiritual realm. But I'm going to tell you right now, you've got evidence every day. I want to stand before the Lord and see that 100% of my life was lived out for Jesus. 100% of my life. You know, Brother Yun's going to come here on Sunday morning. He's an example of a person who lives out 100% of his life for Jesus. And, and Darlene, his wife, is going to be with him. I'm pretty sure she's an example. They, too, are examples who live out their life 100% for Jesus, you know. And, and, and they're, they're great models of that. There is so much potential in this room. There is no reason for anyone to get stuck. You're going to have to get unstuck. The problem is you get fearful and you get intimidated because you begin to step out in these things in God and you're overwhelmed with the issues of trust. You're overwhelmed with how are you going to do this and how are you going to take care of that and how are you going to take care of this bill. Forget about your bills. Forget. You know what? The credit score is a make-believe system anyway so that you can somehow be convinced that you need to go borrow more money. So that you can be bigger in debt. Come on, give me a break. You, oh, well, we just want to be, we want to be honest with men. Go bankrupt. Because it's better to be honest with God than to be honest with men. Hey, if you can be honest with God and be honest with men, then fine. But be honest with God first. Because people have put too high of a premium on being honest with men when it's at the expense of being honest with God. I want everybody to be honest with God and men, okay? Absolutely. But the reality of it is, if I've got to choose, and I'm saying to you, if you've got to choose, you need to start being honest with God. Eh? Yeah. So then what happens, because, and I'm telling you this, because what happens, if I got you, if I convinced you tonight to quit your job tonight, to quit, to resign in the morning, to allow your life totally to be redefined in God, you're going to deal with some stuff that you've never dealt with in your life. You're going to deal with, your, the fears are going to become apparent. The intimidation, the war is going to begin. You're going to begin to feel what I dealt with, you know, about 20 years ago. And people want to go ahead and move on in God and not yet move on into reality. Praise God for the spirit of truth to come to lead us and guide us in all truth, but you're going to have to quit walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Are you listening to me? See, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me tonight to challenge you. Okay? The reality of it is, is our whole lives need to be mobilized for the purpose of doing exactly what Jesus told us to do. Not kind of doing what Jesus told us to do, but doing exactly what Jesus told us to do. <laughs> our finances need to be about the orphans. It need to be about the widows in affliction. It needs to be about taking care of the poor. It needs to be take about taking care of the traveling ministry in the local church. It's what it needs to be about. Those five things. And Father is definitely... He's commanded it, and so therefore if he's commanded it, then he's also going to be the one who provides us with the ability to do it. However, we withhold. Why? We say, well, I've got to take care of my stuff, and after I take care of my stuff, then. My wife began to deal with this a long time ago. I said, baby, we're on the bottom of the list. What we're going to do is I know, and especially after we started having a place where we were then looking to the church for more of our financial support, which, which happened back 
you know, in about the mid-1990s, because up until that time we did it, but about the mid-1990s, we started looking for the church financial support, and I said, honey, this is the way it's going to go. It's the church and the ministry first and the things we're doing in the ministry and then what's ever uh, left. And so there would be times where, you know, we would be in great need, but um, a traveling ministry was going to come in, and I'd say, no, all the money goes to him. Huh? And, we, and it was total abandonment. No, all the money goes to them with total abandonment. Now, what happens is when you're willing to do that, when you're not willing to put yourself in the equation, what happens is God then works a miracle and takes care of you. He provides for you. And then what happens is then you find yourself now going into a larger capacity in God to be used more because he's just looking for people who will absolutely and totally, with total abandonment, trust him. Otherwise, you're stuck. You're stuck on the merry-go-round. You're stuck going round and round, grinding, you know, grinding a meal for a world system. Grinding email for a world system. And spiritually, you can't see that that's what you're doing. Spiritually, you don't realize that you have broken, you broken league with the covenant. That the covenant, central to the covenant, is go into the world and preach the gospel. That our whole life is defined in the perspective of that Jesus be, being, uh, to be being glorified in our spirit and in our bodies which are his. That we no longer live. That our whole purpose is an ambassadorship in which we have been given the privilege to proclaim the word of God. To, to say to people, believe in everybody that we see that believes, really vested with the authority to say your sins have been forgiven you. You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You're born again. What a privilege, you know. Or to those who do not believe to say, you're damned, you're cut off. And, you know, that's really the, the context in which we understand John chapter 20. Whosoever sins you retain, they shall be retained. Because, and whosoever sins you remit, they shall be remitted. Because that's what God has given to us as his ambassadors to go preach in the gospel. People see and believe. We can say to them, your sins are washed away. What a privilege. How many, how many children right now, I mean, I'm like, my heart's busting. For, the, for Kurds, we're thinking about what song we're going to sing in the meeting and the Kurds, baby kids in the, in, the, in the Kurdish community in northern Iraq are dying of starvation and, and, being, and can't go to sleep because of the threats because on one side is ISIL and on the other side is the, is the U.S. bombing everybody. I mean, think about it. That's just one small little reality tonight. And you and I can do something about that. You and I have an authority to change this. You and I have an ability, a creative ability, if we should so get pushed into such passion with total abandonment. <laughs> and I mean, that's really one of the things I could say about Mayer is that, you know, yeah, clearly he was a persecuted minority that just said, no, I'm going to do something about this situation. What if we had it? What if we, does, does, does the church... Are the only way the church ever going to get filled with the fire and the zeal and passion of God is to become a persecuted minority? Because we're certainly not a persecuted minority. We got, we got all kinds of freedom. I can go evangelize on the street corner anywhere right now. I mean, come on. That's why, uh, that's why Tim said the other day, he said, you know, if the door's not open for me, I'll build a door and walk through the thing. Open it for myself. Because there's a street corner on every block. There's four of them. Or more, right? Come on. Come on. Jesus, help us. Well, I don't have enough resources. you got two hands and two feet. That's the resources God gave you. Amen. Use those resources and watch what God will give you. Give you more resources. Come on. Come on. Hey, we got to learn how to do this with total abandonment. I modeled this. I lived this. Man, I'm telling you right now. Out, on the, out at the Mission Training Center... We needed a tractor desperately. But as soon as I heard Phil say that he tore his tent in his, in his arms, building the last uh, housing structure for the people that are coming there to do missions in Africa, I said, I'm shipping my tractor to you. Okay, it's coming to you. So I said, well, don't you need it too? And Phil said, you need that thing. I said, don't you worry about me. I'm sending my tractor to you. God's going to give me another tractor. Just relax. Uh, and he's going to give me one. And I described the one he's going to give me. I described while I was standing there. I just described the one that the Lord was going to give me because I wanted him to feel good. Remember? I described the one that the Lord was going to give me and the Lord gave it to me inside of a year. True. 
True, true story. Not a false story. Not something that happened back in the 19, you know, whatever. It happened just recently kind of thing. And we could go on and on. And I want, I just want to testify. I'm testifying of what God will do. He's trustworthy. He's trustworthy. He's, 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 is God not honorable enough? Is God not viewed within our, uh, within our perspective of having a, a, a enough honor and integrity to be counted good for his word? True, he is. So we, we, we're like sitting around going, God, you go first. Put the money in the bank and then I'm going to do it. God doesn't do it that way. He did put the money in the bank when Jesus died at Calvary's cross, rose from the dead the third day. He said, up on high, he put the money in the bank. Amen. He put the greatest, most wealthiest deposit for you that you can imagine, the salvation of your soul and the guarantee of the resurrection of your body. How much is that worth to you? How much is that worth to you? How much is that worth to you? Come on, think about it. How much is that worth to you? My goodness, it's worth everything. I mean, it so comes, becomes the whole summation of Paul's life when he said that if by, if by any means possible, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He said, I live beating under my body. I'm telling my body, listen, you're not going to tell me to slow down. I'm keeping everything in a subjection. Otherwise, I could end up being a castaway here. Huh, come on. You know, think about it. I'm going to run wide open with this thing. I'm not going to let up. I'm going to do, I'm going to be faithful to the things that God has given me to do. No. Let me say this. By and large, the people that come into this ministry, I see you as faithful within a framework of your commitment. All I'm crying out to you is to say, saying to you, God wants it all. He wants you to consecrate your all to Him, not just your tenth to Him, not your 30% to Him, not your half to Him. Not, he wants your all. If you will not, if you will refrain yourself from doing your own pleasure on my Sabbath day, God says, if you won't speak your own words, if you will give yourself completely over to me, then I'm going to cause you to write upon your high places, number one, to be blessed with all spiritual blessings, to have soul prosperity, and cause you to to eat or receive in to yourself the full heritage of Jacob. Well, then come on. Mayor, Mayor Rothschild, persecuted, locked up at night in, on Jew Street, uh, couldn't own land, couldn't pursue a trade, private of, of his basic human rights, rises up and says, I'm going to take over. And within, within a generation, takes over the world banking system within a generation. Give me a break. Come on, people. Come on. I can't let that stand. I mean, he, he just took a, I, I imagine, I, the only thing I can imagine is somehow he took a hold of some degree of the word of God that says, you'll lend to many nations and not borrow. And he took it over in a purely human way and without divine assistance. And yet, there was enough wisdom, enough insight, enough passion, enough, enough determination. And he was completely given all, totally given over to the whole thing with total abandonment. And it's a great biography to read. If you've never read the biography of, my, of Mayor Rothschild, it's a great biography. Because I hear people talk about all the conspiracies around them. The thing about it is, when I heard all those conspiracies, I said, well, what, what am I going, who, who is this guy? Well, who is he? Where did he come from? What, how, did he get, how did he do what he did? And then I, and I behold this guy, look, goodness gracious, people, turn the thing around for just a minute. I mean, give your anti-Semitism a break, a time out, and think about what one man did to change the world. I mean, how about you and me? How about you and me who have been empowered with divine gr grace to do this? With me? Okay, I want you to, I'm, we're going to worship here in a little bit, just don't move. I want, you to, I want you to hear me out on this thing. I want you to listen to me. I don't want you to be hearer of the word only, deceiving yourself. I want you to change. you got to find some measurable way to change tonight. And those of you who've not yet stepped into this crazy idea and notion that you've got to be serious about your career, let me just help prevent that for tonight. Don't be serious about no stinking career. <laughs> Those of you who aren't in the prison yet and haven't drinking the Kool-Aid yet, okay? Don't be so concerned about your own personal development. Let's get this thing right. Let's get this thing right. Let's get concerned. Uh, let's get extremely concerned huh, about our souls.
and about doing what God has called us to do. Let's let God define. It's hard for a person to do as I've done and just reset their life and say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm following Jesus. I'm doing the ministry. And I'm going to find ways to do this to where that it can be sustainable, where we can see whatever it takes to see the ministry funded in a sustainable way. You can do that too. God will give you wisdom and insight. God will give you practical knowledge. There's a knowledge of just information. And then there is a knowledge of practical knowledge where you do something with it, where you create something that didn't exist before, where you can apply your hand and all of a sudden, without the help of, you know, <laughs> all these other structures that basically give you permission to do what you could never do by yourself. Are you with me? Do you understand what I mean? Huh? NASA gives people permission to do things that they could never do by themselves. Okay, are you with me? Uh, General Atomics does the same. I can go on and on and on and on. But Papa's given us permission. He's given us a broad place to live in. Can I help you? Can I? I mean, this is why we took you out this past this past summer and said, we, I said, we, you know, we got around a table and said, we've got to cast vision. We can't let, we can't stand by and watch the world snatch, continue to snatch away the resources of the kingdom of God and to professionalism. And then you go and you get yourself a house and you get yourself a car and you get yourself a this and you get yourself a that and all oh, you're serving Jesus full time, just praying all day long, go praise God. Because that's not what it's about. It's about doing all day long. Oh, praise God. It's about going all day long. It's about, it's about fulfilling those things which, which we... Take that away from him. Uh-uh. Well, otherwise, we have to put you on the back row. Or maybe in the closet where you can't disturb. No, we love having you guys here. It's good to have you right here on the front row, but you've got to stay with us. Did you see somebody else doing their... FaceTiming while they were on the, in the meeting. So everybody got to understand, you can't be doing text and FaceTiming and whatever else during the meeting. You know that? Because this is the most important thing that's going on in our lives. Is whether or not we're going to really truly step into the opportunities that God has given us. I'm here tonight talking to you about the unlimited possibilities that the Lord has made available to you. I'm talking about, I'm talking not... It's not, I'm not blowing smoke. I'm telling you, God's given you more than can be quantitated. He's given you a vast amount of wealth and inheritance. Things have got to change within the framework of the way we do it. We just got to step back and say, and I ask the honest question, Lord, am I obeying you? Lord, am I doing what you call me to do? Okay, Lord, then how can I do it more? And how can I do it better? Okay, how can you become more the central hub then? of the activity how can i use then that which i'm doing let's say you're doing it eight to ten hours a day most people do most people work that hard okay and um, then there's some another smaller group of people who work just all the time and whatever whatever that arena of work is that you do how then can it be so integrated into the kingdom of god that you don't know whether you're working or uh, w working in a, in a secular job or working in the ministry. You can't even hardly tell the difference, right? Uh, because if you're working teaching children, orphans on the mission field, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, would you, right? Because what you're doing is hopefully you wouldn't be teaching them, you know, just uh, how to count to 10, but you would be teaching them the fundamentals of the things of the Spirit. Hallelujah. So I, I, wanna, I really want to challenge you in these things. Uh-huh. I want God to begin to stir up. I'm asking Father tonight, and I pray that you'll ask with me. I'm asking Father to give us creative ideas. I'm asking Father to give us wisdom and insight to see what is very apparent that all we got to do is if we'll set things right in our spirit and our heart and we'll set out to obey Him, that He will show us. He's not going to show us until we obey Him. But I'm, I'm asking Father tonight, I want you to ask with me, to show us things that we don't have the intellect to see. Not, in it, not when you're real comfortable. You know when you are really the smartest? You know when you really think the best? When you're about to die. When you're, about, when you're trying to survive. That's when you think the best. The rest of the time you're just kind of... You're just dealing with the sensory, the sensory things and spirit. Spewing out information that maybe you've retained, and you know what I'm saying? 
I mean, <laughs> but when you are about, when it's self-preservation, <laughs> huh? Come on now, you know? Hey, people, when I go to work, I like to work with people that don't have to chew the cud so for long before they digest it. You know what I'm saying? I like people to get up and start running with the program. We sit around chewing the cud so long before we ever assimilate it or digest it. Come on, it's true now. Come on now, listen to me. Help us, Jesus. I'm asking for a miracle tonight. I'm asking for a miracle. I'm asking for, I'm asking for a move of God. We have authority to make disciples out of nations. Let's quit playing pretend. We have an authority to change the world around us, to reach the lost, to, 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 to advance the kingdom of God. Come on, we've got to somehow lay hold on the reality of this because it's just so impossible we can't even begin to deal with it. You know, especially when we live continually after a, lot, a logic, logical thinking and logical mind. Are you with me? Let me read a couple of verses of Scripture to you. Can I read some shocking verses of Scripture yes. to you? I tell you shocking because I just want you to go ahead and get ready now. <laughs> And then it won't be over too overwhelming for you. Uh -huh. So, I, I'm just going to break into Psalms 37 at verse 18. It's not going to be my focus, but I just want to break in here. It's hard to break in. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Wow. Wow. Father, what plans you've got for us? This is amazing. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. Basically what we were telling you, ministering to you on Sunday night from Jeremiah uh, chapter uh, 17, just briefly, also from Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, and sit in the seat of the scornful. What is that man going to do? He's going to be blessed. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord. And, 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 and the Lord is the sole object of his trust. What is that man going to do? Think about the prosperity that God has, has, uh, has announced for us. The spiritual prosperity that God has announced for us. Now think about the things that are in the way because God cannot lie. And he's very effective at doing what it is he does. And what does it take us? A whole lifetime to finally begin to cooperate or does, it, or, does some, or does most people maybe not even get into the lifetime because they're busy in self-pursuit. What's my own interest? What is in it for me? I'm not willing to go all the way with God. I'm not willing to be 100% consecrated to God. I'm not willing to be serious about my soul. Uh -huh. Paul was radical in Hebrews chapter 2 when he said, don't neglect. He didn't say reject. He said, don't neglect the salvation. The so greater salvation because he said you'd surely perish because neglect is going to result in deception. Neglect is going to be result going to result and you be taken out. How many people know they're deceived? Nobody that's deceived know that they're deceived. Tough thing. So how many of you know you're not deceived? Well, the scripture says we have the spirit of truth. He's lead us and guide us in all truth. Yes, he is, but are you obeying? Fundamentally, can you measurably look at I am obeying the spirit of truth? Or am I just living under the mercy and grace of God as a, as a newborn babe? I don't want to take everybody's confidence from them tonight. I don't want to give you confidence. I want to rather stir you up on another side of saying, wait a minute, I'm not going to be assimilated into a world system. I'm not going to be neutralized by a world system. I'm going to go all in for this thing in God. There's people that are supposed to be here tonight. We've actually given them place in the ministry in the building, and they're not here, and that bothers me. I mean, there's, look, you know, if you're in, you've got to understand, you've got to, you, you have to be all in, dear folks. You've got to be all in. We can't just have folks just hanging out and occupying and posing because what's going to ultimately happen to that, through that, is people are going to be deceived on our watch. And I'm not interested in letting, watching people be deceived on my watch. Huh? Where, where is everybody? I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful that you're here. I'm blessed that you're here. It's a blessing to me that you're here. I'm just thinking about all the other resources. I'm thinking about the whole dynamics of which we all find ourselves in where we're constantly being overwhelmed by the fears of this life, by the cares of this world. 
We've got to somehow find a way now in consecration to God, in passion, in, in, in a place to where but now with total abandonment, we, we've got to go for this with total abandonment. There can't be any more lukewarmness. There can't be any half measures anymore. It's got to be fiery zeal and fiery passion. Amen. Nothing else will do. No, nothing else. Nothing else will do. I mean, when you begin to tell Father, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll be whatever you want me to be. With total abandonment of God, you got my all. You better, you better know this. You better know this. Father heard that. And he took it for true. It's not a good thing to lie to Papa. He took it for true. Okay? And, and it, it is an awesome thing to think that Father has personal knowledge of me by first name. I'm just going to try to inch, inch into that here. You know, I want to sing and I want to worship here a little bit in just a minute. But I, I, want, I just want to capture this moment. I want to capture this moment in God. I'm going to tell you, there's been many, too many times, I'm going to say this, there's been too many times that I felt a strong anointing that we started singing and then I had to go and get, I had to go, as it were, chasing people by the Spirit because it was wrong. Things were wrong. And, I'm, and I don't like doing it. So I'd rather just get things over in a place where it's properly put in a place. Then you start worshiping God so the Holy Ghost isn't grieved and we don't have to try to correct folks, you know, and deal with things where, you know, bottom line of it is half people are online with God and half people are just sitting lip syncing before the Lord and defiling, you know, their selves. You know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? God give you understanding. Because I know what I'm saying. I deal with this. I've actually... Spent a lot of time talking to other ministers. Hey, do you deal with this? I know one, one minister, one renowned minister said, I don't even want worship in my meetings. Don't even want it. Don't even want it. I just want to preach. Oh, it's just too often, too often, everything's messed up. Because it's a vain oblation. All of a sudden, the whole atmosphere begins to change. Because now you start hooking up with people worshiping, and they're not worshiping at all. You start hooking up with something that is not right and proper. People need to fear God. Yeah. And keep his commandments. <laughs> and walk in love. And tremble. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I came here tonight trembling. I came here tonight having no confidence in my own, own human ability. Having no agenda. Having no topic that I wanted to discuss with you that's really been on me. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm trembling before God. Say, Father, I'm your oracle. I'm your mouthpiece. I'm your voice. Speak through me, oh, Papa. Street, street, speak through me, Father. I'm here representing you. It's amazing how many people are speaking on behalf of God. You know, we, you know, Ann and I were just looking at the different television ministries, and I'm just like, I'm going through it, and I just listen. All these people are saying what God's got to say, and it's like, my, 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 my. Come on, folks. The world hath need of thee. Go out and get a ministry. Come on, get, get, go get a, go to a foreign country. Something. Come on. Go, go, get, go get involved in the things that are going to change the way you talk and behave and think. I'm saying that to you tonight. I'm saying it with all of my heart, desperately. I mean, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, a somewhat of a uh, sacrifice to have Kelly and Paulina and Angelo take off, but they're doing great. And I, and I want them to continue to do great. And they're wa running wide open and, and the one door after the next door and one church after the next church is opening to them. And they're having a great time and they're out there preaching, you know, repent or perish and praise God for that. I'm stoked. I'm, I'm believing God for great things. Well, I believe the same thing for you. How many of you are going to the mission field? Or how many of you are going to your career? How many are going to the king, into the kingdom of God? And how many of you are going in to, you know, personal pursuits. I, I, want, I, want to, I want you to begin to visualize what it looks like to be all in on the kingdom of God and to be resourced in the kingdom of God by God himself. Uh -huh. 
Because you can't say, oh, I'm going to go and get a degree and I'm going to go become an expert in these things. Ultimately, then to get on a career path where you're just all about making money because you got to go make money because you went and bought this thing, that thing, the other thing because you're planning all these things for yourself. That's what happens. It's the trap. When most people, they put their foot in the trap, they can never get out. It's just, for, as far as for my wife and I, we just simply said, when we bought a house, when we, we were bivocational always in ministry, we said, Lord, we're willing to walk away from this house tomorrow, the day we bought it. In fact, we'll leave this afternoon, and we kept it there every day. Eh? And then when we had an opportunity to do something more, to say, look, you, this is a way for us to get resources, we're all in. How do we do it the most? Okay, how do we do it? How do we do it? How do we get these things moving forward in the kingdom of God, both locally and, and nationally and internationally? I want you to think this way because I believe it's the only right way to think. I don't believe there's another way to think. I honestly don't. I don't. I don't believe there's another way to think. God told us, I'm supposed to take care of you until you grow up enough in God to be sent out. That's all. I'm supposed to teach you to, and establish you to where that you ultimately go do the work of the ministry. That's all I'm supposed to do. I'm to teach you to observe all things that he has commanded. And one of the things that he's commanded you is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And to do the work of the evangelist. And to do it locally as well as to do it, to do it nationally and internationally. To go all, among all the cities and towns and minister. And somebody said, do I really have to do that? Well, you know, there is a place and a position that we can find in the scripture where you can live to support the ministry. True. And so we can, I can give a bunch of different examples of that. And, and that certainly is a, a reasonable approach. You can live to, um, as it were, be a, a pillar in the local church to where that ultimately more and more people can be processed through to be sent out. But we certainly can't get stagnated and stop. And it certainly isn't going to be amount to, you know, 50% of your finances and 50% of your money. It ain't going to do that. I mean, 50% of your time, finances and 50% of your time. It ain't going to be that. It ain't going to be that. Not if it's gone. It ain't going to be that. It ain't going to be that. That's nonsense. It ain't going to be that. That's not what God promised. That ain't what my father promised. Huh? It's not what he promised. It's not what he promised. I want to get you out of your career. Can I get you out of your career tonight? Can I get you out of your professional mentality tonight? Can I get you, can I get you out of living for yourself? Can I get you to quit justifying your workplace that's not about the kingdom of God? Can I? Can I get you focused on the fact that you've got a very short time left on this earth and that the Lord is not going to be impressed with your credit score? And he's not going to be impressed with what, all, of the, all the money that you have? Because in fact, he, he turned around and he said, where your treasure is, there's where your heart is also. Where's your treasure? I mean, can you say tonight, I have deposited my treasure into the kingdom of God and into this ministry? Can you say that? I've deposited my treasure. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on now. Come on. Think about it. The church does represent the kingdom of God. It's the vehicle of the kingdom of God. It's not the, it, it, the church, the local church, should not be the, the, the um, ultimate end it, it, because it's, it's got to be perpetuated. Because if it's the ultimate end, then there's no growth. If you, don't, if you don't rise up from out of here and go elsewhere and, and, and be raised up by God to participate in the planting and the development and the growth and the advancement of other churches in the land, then it's going to stop. It's going to die out. Right? So, by, so just sensibly, it, it can't, it's just stopping off place. It's going to be here, and, then, and there needs to be more. And, and one of the things is we're getting ready to have a meeting, and it's all going to be about I am remnant. Are you? She even said to me today, she said, I would really like to be able to start, start something that would be a challenge. Are you remnant? I think that'd be good. I think you should brainstorm around here and see if you're remnant. See if you're remnant. See if you're that, that material that was so given over to the purposes of God it could not fit in the framework of the world. It was retained under the Lord to fulfill everything that he commanded. 
You should think about that. Do you think for a second that I feel like I've done what I'm supposed to do and that I'm good to go simply because I pastor a church and I've been pastoring a church for uh, 32 years? There in no way, man. I am so stirred like I haven't even started. I haven't even gotten up off my chair yet. I mean, what's wrong with me kind of thing? Give me a break. I'm not, I'm not sitting over here in a self-justified state. My wife's saying slow down. I said, we'll slow down in heaven. Huh? Think about it with me, dear people. I'm trying to be an example to you. I'm just trying to talk to you here. I'm trying to get you in. I'm trying to get you all in. Completely all with total abandonment in. Here. Because for me, I'm a literalist in the scripture. I'm a literalist. I believe I have to be a literalist. I believe that I have to read the Bible for exactly how God said it instead of how I want to interpret it or what spin I want to put on it or how I want to self-justify myself to say, yeah, you know, I've really been doing that because after all, look at what I've done. Look at what I've done. Give me a break. The Lord's still giving us a commission and an authority to go make disciples out of nations. I haven't made a disciple out of a nation yet. Have you? Are you with me? Come on now. Come on now. Hello, let's get to moving. Say, oh, this is put too much pressure on me. I was already stressed out. I went to the dentist today. Can you turn me up? Because I don't even sound like I'm on. Oh, man, I, I, look, people, it's a divine opportunity. I'm not concerned about anything other than one thing. I just don't want you to be self-justifying, creating a false world, Believing that you're doing something you've never done. I just want everybody to get real. Okay? As long as we're real with God, He can begin to move in us. He can begin to lead us. He can begin to guide us. He can begin to correct things in us. He can, he can begin to set things straight. If we're deceiving ourselves, there's no hope for us. We, we, we sit around and we talk about how good we are and all we've done and how we're rich and how. Well, come on, give me a break. There's none. The Lord's going to say you're miserable, you're blind, you're naked, you're wretched. What a sermon. <laughs> sermon of the Lord Jesus. Miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. Uh-huh. It's a sermon of Jude. Twice plucked up by the roots. I mean, come on, you know. Clouds without water. No. No, no. Man, I'll tell you right now. Come on, people. Let's be a thunderstorm in the kingdom of God. Come on. Let's, 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 let's bust this thing wide open. Let's start, let's start taking on an identity. I mean, what is it going to take? Do we need to put badges on you? Do we need to, do we need to tattoo you in your forehead? I'm a Christian. I belong to God. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Just ask me, what does it take for us to begin to be in charge? Can you become in charge of the gas station? When you stop at the gas station, I'm in charge. I'm looking around. Is there someone here that, could, that wants to go to heaven? Is there someone here that's going to die tonight? I'm looking. I'm asking God. I'm walking down the road. Is there someone... Lord, here, as I'm walking down this road, that I can reach for you, is that we'll have time enough to hear. I mean, just becoming about the master's business, it becomes a shift, it's a change. And once you do it, suddenly now God can begin to get through to us. He'll, he'll begin to move in a great way with some, for someone who will just crack the door of their life in obedience. I'm about you, God. I'm, I'm going to consecrate myself to you tonight. I'm going to give myself completely over to you. Because be holy, God says, even as I'm, I'm holy. God is full-time God. He's full-time about heaven. He's full-time about what it is that is truth and, and what, who it is that he is. And he, and he wants us to be full-time ministry and full-time about who we are and, and, and no vacation and no time off. And when we do, all of a sudden, every dynamic of our life begins to change. Truth begins to issue, issue forth from us. Suddenly sounds that have not been heard in the earth are being heard through us because we really truly have given ourselves over as those people who represent the Father, represent the Holy Spirit or the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. He's unseen. I'm his vessel to which he's seen through. And I want to be a perfect representation of seeing him so that if you see me, you've seen him. And I want you to do that because I don't know of any other Christian identity. I don't know of any other position or place. I, I know no, I'm no other realm in which you're to occupy in the, realm, in the New Testament. We're going to do this. I'm telling you right now. I'm sorry that I, I, I'm sorry I didn't get it before. 
I thought people would just do what I did. I, 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 wasn't able to, I wasn't able to put myself where other people are at and say, you know what, you know, it's okay to go to school and it's okay to, to go after a vocation because you're never going to put that first. God's kingdom will always be first. I just thought everybody processed that way. I didn't, and, and, I, and I didn't get it. I, I didn't get it that so many folks get stuck into a world of false security because my security is all in Him. I, 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 if, if, to, if tonight the world blew up and there was no, uh, grocery, no food in the grocery stores, or I'm fine, I'm not changed, I'm just as good, I'm living just the same. Everything is still fine for me because I live by faith. So many people are going to wait till later to start learning to live by faith. I want you to live by faith now. You can't wait, wait till later to learn how to live by faith. You're going to have to start now knowing how to, to, to reach into that realm of supernatural supply. Hallelujah. Praise God. See, I'll watch a miracle, I'll watch a miracle take place here tonight. I'll watch a financial provision, a financial miracle for the rent for this month that's coming up for this place. I'll watch it happen tonight. Why? Because it's time. We need it. I'm in the realms of the Spirit. I'm walking in the things of God. I'm doing what God's telling me to do. I'm prioritizing things according to His call. I'm not one moment concerned about it or worried about it. If I were, it's one of the first lessons I mentored my wife in. Baby, if you're at all concerned about it, if you're all worried about it, you have to recognize it's fear. And so long as fear is present, faith won't work. Now, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you but I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna put the raw reality of it on you. And it didn't take her long to recognize. It's like, okay, it's, okay, she's processing this thing. This is early on in our marriage. I mean, you know, she didn't know what it meant to live in the, in the ministry. She didn't understand that. And now she's, she's dealing with, she's dealing with, you know, two times, two times more going out than what's coming in. And she, she saw that when she feared and fretted about it, it was like a faucet turned off. And as soon as she rather just, you know how you deal with fear when you don't know how else to deal with fear because you just, you've never been developed in bravery? You walk around praising God. And so you learn how to just praise. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Just don't give it. You keep praising, and you can't get any place to fear. And then she'd find out, and she'd watch as the faucet got turned wide open. So God wants to teach you. Because though she loves me, she'll do anything I say. She's hooked up with me 100%. She's never kicked against me in any way. Still, she's personally got to go through it and process through it to deal with all the internal issues. So do you. And you don't get to until you get engaged. And you can't tell me that you're engaged when it's not all about the kingdom. When you haven't abandoned everything, when you're not been willing to, I mean, think about it. I want you to think about it. I want you to put yourself here tonight, every one of you. No one except, no one's excluded. You're going to quit your job tonight. And you're going to turn to 100% pursuing the things of the kingdom. 100%. All effort, all mental ability and physical ability and spiritual ability. 100 goes 100% beginning tomorrow morning into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. 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 Are you ready? Can't you feel that? Wow. Amen. Let's do this thing. Get your resignation ready. And now watch God redefine your life for you. That's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be, well, what about this and what about that? It doesn't matter. It's nonsense. It's irrelevant. The Lord says it doesn't count. Your what abouts don't count. Because he already told you, you, so you just get to see you've been in disobedience. Because he already told you there was no what about. He said, take no thought for your food or what you should wear. <laughs> hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Father and Holy Spirit. Huh? Are you ready? Are you ready? And this is one time that I can understand a faint. This is one time I can understand a, a, a silence. But you know, think about it. I've been talking to you, about, some of you have been talking to you like this for 30 years. So I said, is the Lord going to say I've done well? 
I don't know. Is he? I'm not him. You'll have to ask him. I say to the Lord, have I done well? Have I done well, Father? And I go read the Word of God, and I go, I'm going to get after it. But I'm not doing it by works. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm not doing it because I'm under pressure to do it. I'm in a love relationship here. I want to do it. I want to do these things. And so once again, that's where we come back to this, you know, the reality with total abandonment. And we, we go with this with total abandonment. Father, I'll go anywhere you want me to do. go. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll be anything you want me to be. I'll say anything you want me to say. It's all yours. I'm all for you. Whatever. Lord, there's nothing here that I'm going to hang on to. There's nothing here. Everything that I have here, it belongs to you, Lord. It's yours. I give it to you right now with total abandonment. And then what happens when Father begins to nudge on you with these things? What happens in the dynamics when you feel like you gave a little bit too much in the offering and there's been a little bit too much expected of you lately? See, that's the dynamic. Because it wasn't 100%. Nobody gave 100%. They may have given 90% or they may have given 80%, but no one's given 100% really on that, kind of a, on that kind of a basis. I mean, think about it, right? I mean, maybe. Maybe there's some people in here that you give 100% in the offering basket. I mean, maybe you do. And you watch, you, but if you're doing, you're watching some serious miracles. And you're proving God. Hallelujah. You in the throw of it. You in the throw of dealing with every force of doubt and unbelief that would come at you for having given 100%. Because now you took your job and you used it 100% to take care of the ministry. And now Father's going to take care of you. Like you said in the Word. Huh? Ooh. No, we take it off the top for us. No, we do. So he says, oh, no, no, I took it off the top for the Lord. No, you already took it off the top for the mortgage. You already took it off the top for the rent. You already took it off the top for the car. You already took it off the top for this and took it off the top for that. Huh? I want you to take it off the top. I want you to take it off the top because first and foremost, that's where your heart is. Mm-mm-mm. To where that when you think about giving, you're not thinking about well, I got this bill and that bill and the other bill and this bill and then, then bill, 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 bill. It's like one preacher said, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. And he had his little song, right? And, then that, that, and I'm afraid that that's the slavery, the bondage, the beggarly elements. Part of the beggarly elements. Right? That we shouldn't be under the yoke of. That we're supposed to have... A, 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 an ability in the realms of faith in the realms of the miraculous to, to be in charge rather to be, than to be under, this, under, under the yoke of slavery. Now, this, does the scripture talk to slaves? Yes. And so for most of, what if I had to say, be patient with me, what if I had to say for most Christians they fit within the category of being under the yoke of slavery? And you have to serve your master and you can't do anything else just because you're a slave. Huh? That'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Does anybody want to think of themselves that way? Hey? Anybody comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with that? How many of you themselves as slaves? Slaves to the system. Slave to the money that you owe. Can't make your own decision. Can't choose what you're going to do tomorrow. Uh, you can't choose what you're going to do tomorrow. If God told you to go do something tomorrow, uh, like uh, go to, uh, <laughs> go, go to uh, Canada and preach the gospel in Vancouver, no problem. But you, are, are you going to have to check with the boss and the company? You have to run everything by some ungodly person before you can obey the Holy Ghost. I want you to think about this. Uh, see, am, I trying, am I helping you? Am I breaking it down? Do, how many of you think this isn't fair? Be honest, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. You've missed, you're thinking, I've missed some scriptures. I'm not balanced. This isn't fair. Please, pray tell. Where are these exemptions that it seems that most of the church is living under? And what happens is what's, what's systemic to that is all the mess. 
and all the sin and all the lethargy and all the lack of move of God and all the lack of revival and all the lack of power and all the lack of demonstration is systemic to the disease. I hope I've talked everybody out of their careers who haven't gotten into one yet. Anna came to me last month. She said, Dad, I, I just don't want to start a career. I just don't want to get a job when it's time to go preach the gospel. I said, come on, baby. You're done with school now. It's past. All it was, all I looked at it as a, as, as a means to be able to get you into places, places. It was time for you to just part of your preparation and maturing and getting ready to go. Huh? That's the way I feel about it for everybody, not just a few people. That's the way I feel about it for everybody. That's the, way I, that's the way it should be. That's the way I feel about it for Joshua. That's the way I feel about it for Allie. I know that people look at Allie's Facebook and they go, well, all she's talking about is this, this company. Well, that, that Facebook thing is all about the company. That's just it. She, believe me, she preaches the gospel on the ground. Her, the finances she's generating is going into the kingdom. Believe me. They're just, they are just going through a last little hurdle to go full-time into ministry. It's all about going full-time in the ministry. I'm asking you, do you see two, three years and you're full-time in a ministry? That's all I'm asking you. Do you. Are you developing and putting into place and position in your life everything that launches you full-time into ministry, that gives you, a, uh, gives you ability, well, a tent-making ability as Paul had, a creative idea for sustainability within the framework of being able to merge ministry with, for example, the growing crops or, or, or the keeping uh, of, of cattle or, or the, the taking care of, of aquaculture systems or whatever, that right at the heart of it is every day. It's a, about an exchange of the gospel. It's about a means by which we can get to the next village to preach there also, to provide them food for their, belt, for their, for their bodies and, and the spiritual bread for their soul. Because that then becomes my means. It becomes, it, that, the job then takes the gospel where it's supposed to go. Huh? And the gospel, as it were, has a job alongside of it as a servant to it. But we've got it upside down. We're servants to the wrong thing. You understand what I'm saying? So I want you to, I want you, I want you to recognize, I don't care who you are, where you're at, what the prospects of your life are, what you think you're limited to, what your skill sets are. I'm telling you, there is a faith realm that you can enter into no matter who you are. When you say, I'm with total abandonment going to obey you, Lord. I'm going to do what you said to do. I'm going to go reach the lost. I'm going to go lay down my life for the gospel. I'm going to go follow Jesus. Who, can you tell me, give me one example of a person who God says, you don't have to follow Jesus and you're fine. Would you help me? You are exempted. There's a certain class of Christians that don't have to follow Jesus and they're right with God. They're on their way to heaven. It doesn't exist. So as literalists, if we're going to take up our cross and follow Jesus, then what does that look like? Can then you create this world that we now live in and say that we're right with God? I tell you, it's deception. I tell you, it's upside down. I tell you, you've got to be deceived to believe that it's right. Are you listening to me? Am I stirring you? Am I making anybody sick to their stomach right now? It's all right. I got sick to my stomach too. I did. I got sick to my stomach too. I remember the day. I was 22 years old. I got sick to my stomach. Because the word of the Lord came and said, you're preaching the gospel. That's what your life is about. It ain't going to be about this. It ain't going to be about that. You're preaching the gospel. And, and it was real to me. And it's like, and I'm like, no, I'm going to support. And the, and the Lord helped me, helped me to understand that I was preaching the gospel. And I said, yes, sir. Do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I can't do anything else. But I'm, 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 I'm of, of all men most miserable without preaching the gospel. Uh, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Now, the, the question comes to beg, is there anyone who's exempted, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel? Because there's a lot of folks that say, yeah, you're exempt. How many of you believe tonight that you really truly believe that you're exempt from preaching the gospel? You don't need to preach. 
You don't have to be a preacher preaching, preaching, preach. You don't have to do that. Leave that to other folks. You're a singer. <laughs> what? A, I mean, I don't believe that anyone in an honest and sincere heart could say that. Maybe if you're all by yourself in the living room, you might lift your hand up a little bit. But then you're going to come under Holy Ghost conviction. And you're going to go, no, this is not true. This is, I'm commanded to go and preach. We're living, we're living, we're living epistles. You're going to be okay. It's all right. I understand. That's kind of happening to the whole of the church right now. In a deep sleep. And someone's beginning to wake them up and they're like, I wake up. I want to go back to sleep. Who is this guy that came in here and woke us up? What gives him the right? Who does he think he is? Whew. Really, what I'm talking to you tonight about is, emancipation pro is, is an emancipation proclamation. I'm actually setting you free from slavery to a system and liberating you into the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. To live all your days full of joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. John G. Lake had about 20 of his preachers who died of starvation on the mission field. We don't really understand what all went down, but they died of starvation on the mission field. But out of their life grew one of the greatest moves of God that still exists to this day. They were in very poor areas of Africa. They could not survive off the meager kind of diet that those people had, had grown accustomed to living off of. And they died because there was no finances. They started death because there was no money. They got cut off from all of their support because the apostolic movement became very controversial. But look at what God did. I mean, I just had a, a friend of mine telling me, well, they just all of a sudden, just on the spur, announced that they were going to have a camp meeting. And, and, and it was like inside of a week, 100,000 people showed up, truckloads of maize and corn and flour to cook for everybody was there. Tents were erected. Companies were shut down as they brought uh, latrines and, you know, porta potties to the place. And just, what a movement. What a sacrifice. What a movement. What a sacrifice. Look at Jesus, Calvary's cross. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? With total abandonment, a small group of people, the Moravians, ultimately, with total consecration to the Lord, unwilling to any way to reserve anything into themselves, sent more missions, missionaries to the mission field than the great denominations of their day. They had a prayer meeting that continued on that went on for 100 years, 24 hours a day. <laughs> Can the, could a Moravian movement happen again in the, in the love of ease that we now exist in? of the environment that's all about please me, I don't feel full enough. Are you with me? I'm still a little hungry even though I've eaten five times today. It's mentality. Huh? My pillow's now grown hard. It was the softest pillow that they marketed, but now it's grown hard and I need a softer pillow. A softer pillow still. I mean, come on. Lord Jesus. Hmm. What if the Lord is actually rearranging everything right now? Are you ready? Are you really, really, truly ready? Or are you going to hang on my coattail? It's all right, you can. You can. You can, but are you really, really ready to do it on your own? To do faith on your own? To do a move of God on your own? Are you really, really ready? to be dropped off in some foreign field and let God raise up a ministry through your life and all the things around it, you know, that are essential for a ministry to succeed? Huh? 
Are you going to starve? Are you going to have faith to see food multiplied? I really believe that the whole world is changing. I, re I really believe that the whole world is radically changing right now. And I don't, I'm not going on any conspiracy theories here. I just know what's happening. I know where this thing is going. I know that we're living in the last days. I know that it's like a woman who's in travail and her contractions are getting closer to closer. That's the way wars are going to be. That's the way famine's going to be. That's the way earthquakes going to be. That's the way pestilence are going to be. I mean, I, I, I have the, um, the, what is it called? The... Uh, Huh? Disaster alert. My disaster alert is constantly going off. Over the past three weeks, there's been more volcanoes than have been listed in the historical database with that kind of frequency. Up into that time, I seem over the past four years, just earthquakes, bang, 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 bang. I'm getting six, seven, eight in a day. And you used to be all under two. Now they're all like fives and sixes. I mean, just get it. Everybody, anybody can have it. The disaster alert. My just, I just have mine wide open. Though anywhere there's a disaster, as soon as it happens, you know, and then it keeps a track, it tracks everyone and keeps a big database. I'm telling you, you can see these things going on. Furthermore, if I didn't even have that, I know if I didn't have such a means to quantitatively measure this, I know that's what's happening because that's what God says happening. How am I preparing? How are you preparing? The Mormons say you need to have a month and a half food supply in your house. I don't say that at all. That's not preparing as far as I'm concerned. I'm asking you, how are you spiritually preparing to, be, to, to move in God, to be translated like I was talking about the other night, to, to go everywhere preaching the gospel, signs, wonders, and miracles? It just doesn't all of a sudden just happen because you decide, well, now I'm available because you've got to be prepared. And you don't get prepared until you get in the thick of it. You know, they don't, they don't prepare guys to go to the battlefield and have them work it in and out burger. Guys, you're working in and out Burger for two years to prepare to go and be special forces. <laughs> that, they don't do that. They take them through the extreme of everything you're going to have to go through so that they can be prepared to live and survive and do what they need to do. So it's not that diff much different for you and I from a spiritual point of view. We're engaged. Look at the engagement that Paul is addressing to Timothy when he says and he talks to him about being prepared unto everything. Every good work <laughs> in God. I mean, I, we, I, God, I want you to get out of your living room. We want you to get out on the field. We want you to get in the heat of the battle. We want you to advance this thing with us. There's people around me right now, I'm able to say to them, look, I'm going to download this to you because if I download this to you, this means I get to sleep maybe another 30 minutes. And you're helping me so I can go do what I'm doing. I'm glad I've got people around me I can download. Listen, please do this for me. Please do this for me. Please do this for me. Geneva takes a huge load. I mean, if I, if I had to do... Why? Well, there's no way that I would be able to do the things that I'm doing in the ministry if she wasn't doing exactly what she's doing in the ministry. Amen. And we still got a lot of other things going on. There's a lot of open areas where, pe there's, <laughs> where people aren't serving. And uh, we understand you're busy, your career, your job, your house. And I'm just going to lay it out there for you. Somebody said, that's tough. If you, wouldn't, if you didn't talk like that, uh, you could have more people in the church. And you're about to lose me. I mean, this, this is the things that we deal with. I, I, be challenged. Be willing to be challenged. Be willing. Okay, here's what I say. I say, fine, work eight to ten hours. Just give God eight to ten hours. Fine, work eight to ten hours for yourself. Just give God eight to ten. And live off of two hours sleep or four hours sleep, five hours sleep. You can do that. <gasps> yeah, you can have faith to do that. You can do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. How, well, okay, well, how about, how about we just say give God four hours? You give eight hours to you, give God four hours. Huh? We're about to run out of time on this year because we, we, there was a challenge that the Lord gave to us at the beginning of this year to run wide open for God in the things of the Spirit with total abandonment. Come on. And I, I just appreciate my wife. She stepped up. I, I, honestly, I, I got, became concerned about her last month because she was so tired. 
She stepped up. She said, I'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And we ran hard. And we just not, have not let up. And praise God for the things that we were able to get accomplished. Praise the Lord for it. The reality of it is for us, these things were real. We didn't just hear men speaking. You know, it, you know, it would be, it wasn't, I just didn't hear myself speaking. You know, if you, if you want to, as it were, almost negate something, right? You could negate it on the basis of you the one who said it. And so it can't be that, you know, big of a deal. For me, it was God talking. It is to this moment in time. Run, run, run with greater passion. Give more time, throw all in. Be able to say that this is one year in your life that you live with total abandonment to see the advancement of the kingdom of God. We're about, we're about out of time. Happy October 1st. This is the last quarter of the year. And so I, I just pray that you'll just come with me, just make, a, just make an intense push in the kingdom. I, I want to I read, finish reading this to you here in, uh, in Psalms 36. I'm sorry, Psalms 37. He's, the Lord says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume in the smoke and shall consume away. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't believe that, you need to believe that. And it, it, and, and it needs to become so real to you so that you can look at people with great compassion and say, listen, I'm telling you, you are going to perish. You are going to be consumed away. I don't care what humanistic ideas you have. I'm here to warn you. And whatever repercussions they have towards you, whatever nonsense they say, it doesn't really even matter. They that believe shall be saved and they that do not believe shall be damned. That's just the way it is. At least there can be seed sown. Because right now, I think that a lot of the populace of the earth don't even believe that there's people left like this. That even we're going to tell anybody that you're going to be damned. Huh? Well, somebody needs to get a hold of the truth of the gospel. This is the truth of the gospel. This is what God says. But see, you can only speak these things with truth and compassion and authority and love by the Holy Ghost. You're going to have to, and the only way you're going to really move in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you right now, total abandonment. As long as you're holding back on yourself, as long as you're holding back from God and holding on to yourself, it ain't gonna, it ain't gonna flow, man. I know you love God. I know you do anything that you can con conceptualize for the Lord. But it ain't gonna happen until you step that cross over the threshold of total abandonment. And everybody's gonna know when it happens, especially you, because you're gonna deal with the most frightful issues of your entire life. Huh? Yes, you are. The loss of all things. Paul said, I have suffered the loss of all things. For Jesus, I have suffered the loss of all things and count it but done. Come on now. Oh, well, Paul, you're just an exception. No, he's not. I'm going to stand right there. Are you, are you, are you going to stand right on side, Paul? This is, if this is condemnation to you, you got yourself a problem. This is condemnation to you. You got yourself a problem. It means that you're hearing, but you're not willing to obey. Do you understand me? Yes. Sad, mad, or glad. <laughs> if you're mad at me, you got yourself a problem. Uh -huh. Because that's religious. Right? That's, this is the way it is. I mean, these are the dispositions and the responses to the Word of God. God describes the responses to the Word of God. Somebody stopped me in the... It, as I was going out last night, and they said, hey, listen, what does this mean? Or, or Sunday night, what does this mean, this scripture? What does this mean? That, that uh, you should, seeing you should not perceive, hearing you should not hear, with your heart you should not understand, unless you should be converted and I should heal you. Here's what it means. They had the gospel preached to them one too many times. That's what it means. One too many times they said in the meeting, and still would not obey. And finally the Lord says, Seeing you should not perceive, hearing you should not hear, with your heart you should not understand, lest you should be converted and I should heal you. People, there is a time, you know, and we all have to deal with this. I fear God. He is worthy to be obeyed if he told us to do the worst and unimaginable things, like go and sacrifice our firstborn child on an altar. He's worthy to be obeyed. Huh? He knows he knows how this really works and where our hearts truly become fully given over 
to right living and right thinking. He knows what it takes. And so he describes what it takes and watches all of us as we begin to get sorted out by our willingness to obey, believe, trust. Father wants you to trust him with everything, not some things. And you're never going to know if you trust him with everything until you have to trust him with everything. Huh? Right now, how much do you trust him with? Come on now! Come on! Put it to the test. Put it to the fire. Have you ever prayed like that? Have you ever said, Father, put me to the test. Put me to the fire. Prove me. Try me. I have. And I continue to do it. I encourage you to do the same thing. I'd like to know now, not later. Huh. If it's all going to blow up, let it blow up now while I can repent. Hallelujah. Let it all come to bear right now while we can regroup. Because heaven and eternity is far more important to me than some temporal leisure. Or some temporal provision. I pray that the reality of eternity strikes your soul for you. So that it can strike your soul for everyone else. You become more serious about your soul than you are about your career, about self-improvement, your position in life, your physical health. Pray in Jesus' name, everybody listening to me on the web. You'll understand the reality and the criticalness of our day. We are living by, by this, I'm going to tell you right now. I believe that with one voice, those whom God has anointed are saying with one voice, these are those perilous days. We are living in perilous days. We are living in the moment of great crisis. And it's the only provision, the only salt, the only light, the only hope, the only means of remedy lie within the church. The only possibility of that being realized is when people fully surrender and consecrate, turn their life over with total abandonment to do exactly what Jesus said to do. It's fundamentally go into all the world and preach the gospel. Lay down your life for the lost. People want to make it about minor things. Huh? About what, how, much, how much jewelry they're wearing or the clothing that they have or huh, whether or not they do this or do that. And give me a break. It's a bigger picture. What God has called us to do when, he, when Jesus said, Come, follow me. Forsake everything. Forsake it. Come, follow me. Come, practically lived out, seen, witnessed, silver and gold have we none. It's all deposited in the kingdom. So they could say, silver and gold we have, none, have we none. And really, by and large, still in the context of everybody coming and laying at the feet of the apostles all that they possessed because it really came, became a general fund about how do we go ahead and advance these things in the kingdom. Oh, boy, what if you had unity? What if we had solidarity? What if everybody's finances and resources and, and, and personal strength and human ability was centered 100% on taking the gospel to the nations of the earth? And not going at, not going at the hard cases, bypassing the hard cases. Come on. Get, learn how to shake the dust off your feet when it's necessary. When, because there's just too many orphans and too many children and too many people who are willing to hear the gospel at the first mention of the name of Jesus. To spend your time spinning your wheels with somebody you don't want to hear. And that's why I believe that Paul said after the second and third admonition, let them be anathema maranatha or accursed until the coming of the Lord. Just move on, in other words. They rejected the gospel. They damned. What happens when God's people become that bold, that certain, that full of truth that you can speak with that kind of authority and speak the truth in love and compassion? What happens? Change happens because that's the power of the gospel. We, we draw back. We, we merely mouth it. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings because I want everybody to like me. No, I want everybody to like Jesus. Amen. I'm not interested in everybody liking me. I'm interested in people's lives getting changed. I'm, listening. I'm, I'm interested in them confronting truth.
You know, I watch people, man. I watch them. They know. I was watching a guy talk to me. He just talking. He's standing there with his beer in his hand. Everybody knows the Lord, you know. Then all of a sudden, he found out I was a pastor. And all of a sudden, he was cupping that beer. Like I didn't see it. Huh? Like I hadn't already seen it. Now he's cupping the thing and I'm putting it behind his back. Dude, you know what's wrong in your heart, man. I know I need to tell you. Nobody needs to tell you the truth. Huh? Because you know it in your heart. People know it in the heart. They just need somebody to remind them. Oh, come on, let's go preach the gospel. Come on, people, let's go take this. Let's go reach the lost. Come on, let's, let's, listen, if, listen, can I, can I get out of just some kind of little, you know, uh, catchy phrase and just tell you if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough? If your dreams don't scare you, they're not, a, they're not a heaven. They're still tamed by, by human perception and tainted by human interest. Come on. What God has told us to go and do, the things that we've set out our hearts to do. I was flying back from Yanchi, China. and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I, Lord, I want to take everything that I have, everything at, at this moment in time that I have, and I, want to, and I want to give it to you. I don't want to just sell it. I want to give it to you. And, 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 and you know, one of the first and foremost things was the ranch in, that we bought in Oregon. You know, a close friend of mine and I, we bought it. We were going to sell it and just ultimately to reach another goal, to reach another goal. And I, just, and I called him up and I said, listen, the Lord just laid upon my heart. I, I want to take what I have and I want to just sow it in the kingdom. I want to use it for mission training center. I want to just turn it over to the Lord here. How do you feel about it? He's like, I'm all in, man, whatever you say. And then we just stepped out and said, okay, Lord, let, let's just take this thing. To, how, how are we going to do this? We're going to, you know, all of a sudden different friends of mine like Phil Smithhurst and others saying, you know what, we can network. We can really start, you know, bringing in people and, and, and let them process. And then Robbie with Back to Jerusalem said, yeah, we got so many people who are coming to us who want to go to China. It would really be great if we had a place to really kind of sort them out first. Can we do that there? And we know we're open to anything. And the Lord just began to lay upon our hearts. No, I want you to take the orphans. I want you to, that, that when they turn old enough, I want you to promote them, bring them over and train them and then send them back to their nation and see this thing perpetuate, see this thing build. And, you know, when Ann and I were in Nepal this last time and, and we saw what Brim did, Brim Parham, what he did. And he was so far ahead in missions. He, he spent 12 years of his life in prison. He was the, he was the youngest major in the Indian Army, uh, and he was going to be promoted to ultimately reach uh, the, being the youngest general ever in the history of the Indian Army. He was of a special group that was, that was formed by Nepali so soldiers because they're just so brave and so radical. And the bottom line of it is, he just he, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, and he said, I'll go, I'll go with you, I'll go to the cross with you. And he went to his nation and started preaching in an illegal time, constantly getting beat up, constantly getting thrown in jail, ultimately spends 12 years in prison, builds up a great orphanage, builds up a great school, makes it completely sustainable. I'm standing there looking at this thing going, my goodness gracious, this is it, this is amazing, this is so beautiful, this will work. God showed this man. He, 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 God used him in, in every kind of way possible, in every miracle that was this imaginable in the New Testament. And here he is, he had all the practical application. I said, oh, Father, I'll buy this thing and redeem it right now. I don't have any money, but I don't need money. I just need the realms of faith. I'll Buy it, redeem it, open up a door, God, I'll buy it and redeem it. And then, you know, the people who are, who are owners of it, even though it's totally mothballed, they wouldn't sell. They wouldn't sell it. They sold a big chunk of it right shortly after to some folks that just going to use it to grow crop on, cash crop on. But you know what? I mean, I have a heavenly vision. I have a vision to reach the nations, to make disciples out of nations. I know God is preparing me to walk in the nations just like I did with Nepal. I want you to do the same thing. I want you to engage in the same thing. I want you to believe the same thing. I don't want you to just be, as it were, standing, holding up my arms, as it were, and, and, and being supportive of, of this passion that Pastor Mark has. That's, that's noble, but that's not what it's about. It's about you getting in. I mean, all the way in. In, big time into this thing, man. Come on now. In Jesus' name.
Listen to what the Lord says. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat lambs. They shall consume into smoke. Shall they, so, so shall they uh, be consumed away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and gives. For such as be blessed of him, of the Lord, shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. Though he fall, he should not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I mean, I, I, I just love meditating on the fact that the Lord delights in me. Think about it. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Father is ordering our steps. He's given us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us in all truth. If we're willing to depend upon the Holy Spirit for direction, if we already got our own direction, we're not going to get His. If we're already making up in our own imagination and deciding in our own will and our own thoughts for our own personal interests, we're not going to get His. But with total abandonment, when our, we're allowing our steps to be ordered by the Lord, He said, this is what I want you to do with your life. That is, that is fundamentally having my steps commanded by God. I want you to follow me. You can't get any more exact on where you're putting your step. You can't get any more exact than walking in His footsteps, as Peter said. You can't get any more exact than simply obeying the command as the Lord Jesus Christ gave it. They just scattered abroad whenever we were preaching the gospel. If you're here, there's only one reason for you to be here, and that is training up other people to go. But really, before you can really train up other people to go, you need to go yourself so you can understand the dynamics of it. Before you can train other people up how to move in faith, you need to get on the battlefield of faith so you understand the dynamics of it. Otherwise, all you're doing is talking theoretically. Come on now. Huh? People want to write a book and they never lived a life. Are you with me? You, just, you can't just talk theoretically. You've got, you got to talk from an a action. You've been there. You've felt it. You did it. You lived it. You proved God. You watched it happen. Come on, live the adventure. Come on, live the life. Come on. Come on. Come on, let's do this thing. We're going to worship. You guys are doing good standing there for the whole time. John's about to fall asleep. Are you reading? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> Just, I want to read a couple of verses of Scripture. Colossians chapter 4. I mean, forgive me. Colossians chapter 2. Listen, people, let me just say this. Look, the Lord loves you. Wherever you're at, He loves you. My goodness, God loves you. It's an amazing thing how much He loves us. But we're going to have to have some people that are going to be willing to move out and follow and obey Him. Okay? But we're going, to have to, we're going to have to raise up some troops here that will go over where we're preaching the gospel who's going to live this, who's going to live in the fire of God. Not in the obligation. Huh? Not in the obligation. Well, we've got to do this. And that's goodness gracious. In the fire of God, the passion of God. Pastor, you just don't understand. I know you want me to stay here, and I know I'm so needed here in the ministry, and I know... I know, that I've been, I know that I've been a great help to you, but I, I just got to go. The fire of God's burning on the inside. Go. You hear me say, go. And Kelly came to me and says, Pastor, can I go? Can I go? Can I run with the fire of evangelism? It's just in me. I said, leave. In Jesus' name, I send you. Go. This, this, I'm happy for that. I want that. You need to do that. What does it take to get you moving? Those of you, those of you that are still young and, and haven't gone into yourself into the prison of a career yet, we took you out to the Mission Training Center to cast vision to say, if, you're, if you are going to go to school, and school is a good training ground as long as it doesn't become your life. If it defines your life and who you are and what you're going to be, forget about it. All it was, you were spoiled by the rudiments of this world. You were spoiled. 
You were spoiled. I'm not going to stand by and watch anybody get spoiled. No more spoiling. So that if you're going to go to school, if you're going to do something in education, that you understand here are, the, here are needed things right now within the framework of what will work on the mission field. It needs to be about the mission field. It needs to be about you running with the ministry. Huh? Hallelujah. And not looking for a paycheck. Knowing that God's going to take care of you. Everybody comes around and we say, can you support me? Can you support me? How about God support you? How about you learn how to move in faith? Well, I don't know how to move. Everybody that goes with Phil Smith Hersey, I think, I think their budget last year was, was huge. It was like six million, I think it was. Not, not a single person does he support with one single dollar. Everybody has to move in faith themselves to see finances come in. He's doing what's right and what's just and what's going to make the difference of whether or not those people are going to amount to anything in ministry in the future. Oh, well, they just got to go tr right on somebody else's coattail of faith. C can you hear what I'm telling you? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about the great adventure. We're not talking about the great curse. We're talking about, huh? Those that the Lord blessed, they blessed. Those that the Lord cursed, they cursed. And the Lord has blessed us. Colossians, I want you to read this with me in Colossians chapter 2. And um, chapter 2. Verse 8. And you know, it's just, you know, it, it, this verse of scripture is kind of stuck right in the beautiful flow of, of verse 7, root and build up in him, established in the faith that you've been taught, abounding with therein with thanksgiving. But then he's, there's just like this warning that pops up out of nowhere, right in between that and, 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 and the fact that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you got, you're in the big middle of it. Okay, you see this? Like right in the big middle of one of the most astounding verses of Scripture that describes to us our position in God, what we're, what's, what's happening and what's being developed in our life and who we are, there's this gigantic, you know, flashing light warning that says, watch out. It says, watch out right here. See this? It says, watch out. Because you, could, you might be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceits after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Are you going to follow Christ or are you going to follow a career? Are you going to follow Jesus, doing it his way, seeing a heavenly vision? Look at, look at, look at Abraham. Abraham sets a foundation. He dwelt in tents. He was a traveling evangelist. <laughs> he, was, he, he was, the, as it were, the first Bedouin. He defined the Bedouin culture. Seeking a kingdom whose builder and maker is God, fully living out the commission of God for his life. And now the Lord has taken it to another height with us here. And he says, watch out in the midst of all this realm of you and I being able to be established in faith, representing God fully in, the, in Christ Jesus, the fullness of the God bodily, completing him, having all this position and opportunity. Watch out. You might find yourself assimilated. What are rudiments of the world? It's the way the world system works. It's the way it works. It's the sociology of a culture, of a society, of a people group, of a nation. You in a big middle of one. Hello? You think it's heaven? It ain't. You think it's the will of God? It's not. Can you hear me? Yes. Does my, do I turn, no, I need to turn my mic, mic up? For me, it's so cloudy in here, I can barely see your face. For me, the power of God's all over this thing. You have to deal with what your response is. Is it sad, mad, or glad? Huh? Somebody said, it's neither sad nor mad nor glad. I just feel sick. <laughs> That's called doubt. That's called fear. It's called fear. Don't worry. The Lord will help you. You know, he's going to look at you and go, oh, you have little faith. You know, why did you fear? Huh? Don't you remember anything? Don't you remember the miracles? But he doesn't stop. He continues to teach us and continues to mentor us. But we got to be in the mix. We got to be in the move. We got to be walking it out. 
we got to be with, we got to have a traveling shoes on. That's a, that's feet, prep, with, uh, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. That's moving with it. Don't tell me you feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and you haven't opened your mouth to tell anybody about Jesus all day long. You're the fire of the word of God's not in your mouth. The consequences of the authority of, uh, that God has placed within our life to, to deal with men and the state of their soul has got to come to bear. It has to come to bear. I'm not, this isn't legalism. This isn't trying to push you into something. This is something, this is the call. You've got to deal with whatever it is that's stopping you, man. Bogging you down. And I'm going to tell you right now, watch out. You watch out. You might have been spoiled. Or you might be being spoiled. Or you might have been put into a prison of self-justification. I got the key. I'm unlocking every door here tonight. Ain't nobody going to leave here tonight feeling, uh, saying I'm in a prison. Huh? You leave here tonight saying, Father, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll be whatever you want me to be. I'll say whatever you want me to say. Everything I have is 100% yours. Anything that, is not, that I have that is not yours, I want you to remove it from my life tonight. Now. I don't want it in my life. Everything out. Everything that's my possession that I'm hanging on to for myself. Huh? <laughs> Come on. Se bala kana neshi peratea. Ah, rumon kusina neyapi. Hela si tukuno osi. Hallelujah. Bere na kishi bi aratataya. Mena ne miki se pratusa. You know, I know in my spirit, I'm willing and I have a heart to make provision for everybody. Okay? The scripture says, send portions to them who have nothing. Huh? That's what the scripture says. Eat the fat and drink the sweet. Send portions to those who have nothing prepared for them. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength in the day of adversity. Are you with me? Yes. I know how I feel about being able to have provision for everybody. I, I, I size things up like this all the time, being able to take care of more people. So, and I, I talk about this. I think in terms like this. How do, we create, how do we create communities? How are we able to take care of more people in the time of crisis? And what happens when I'm doing this and I'm processing this way, I know what Father's thinking. How he wants to take care of us. How he will lavishly provide for us. How he will generously provide for us. How he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. How he will supply all that we have need of out of, the, out of his own riches and glory. How, how his promises, how he's there to uphold his word. He watches over it to perform it. How he wants to make us wealthy that he may establish his covenant. And boy, I mean, for me, spiritual wealth, I mean, that wealth of riding upon my high places is bigger than anything else. That wealth of... In, of, of eating of the inheritance of Jacob. All that is is a means or a resource to be able to do what God would give me to do when I'm riding upon my high places, you know. Come on, it's, this is true. This is, it's heaven now. We can live out another culture. We can live out a whole other culture. We can define a whole other culture for humanity. Amen. A heavenly culture now. Not some flaky idea of a utopia. I'm talking about living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in a beautiful and glorious and practical Holy Ghost way that makes disciples out of nations. Jesus, help us. And he is. And then the same thing happens over in Galatians chapter 4. Here the Lord's telling us giving us these great declarations of how that we are heirs of God's sonship authority, co-inheritors with Jesus Christ. I mean, just this lofty declaration of position and power and authority. And then it's like out of the blue, we get another big beware. When you hit verse um, 8, Howbeit then, when you knew not God, you did service to them which by nature are not gods. And I could, we could break that down because now it's, not only for the, it's not only for the Gentiles. The Jews did the same thing, carried away by their idolatry and practices of idolatry. But now after that you have known God, or rather you are known by God, how can you possibly turn again to the weak and beggarly elements and actually desire 
<laughs> to be entangled by their bondage. To actually desire. Because Christ Jesus ain't enough. Because God's promises aren't enough. I need to have some extra additional observances and extra additional helps. Because it's not only, you know, when, the, when you know, Paul really breaks it down and says you observe days and months and times and years. He's really talking about the feast, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, High Sabbaths, uh, Pentecost. Passover. That's what he's talking about. There's no question about that. Because people are saying, you, it's got to be more. There's nothing wrong with the feast. Praise God. They, say, they testify of some glorious and wonderful thing. But when all of a sudden I need that to gain special favor, he say, no, 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 no. You, God knows you. You don't have to gain some kind of special favor by presenting yourself at Passover and Pentecost and having some special kind of event on, on the Feast of Tabernacles or, or Rosh Hashanah. And I can go through the other list of which people are making millions off their book sales right now. I mean, my goodness. All I got to do is start talking about some kind of hidden feast phenomenon and grow my beard and put a yarmulke on. And I'm like, all of a God, look, the, the Jewish tradition got as, got as beat up as, the Christi, as Christianity did through foul minds and vain philosophies and crazy demonic notions. Christ Jesus has all the deliverance that we need. The purpose that God has given us in Christ Jesus is all the purpose that we want. The call of God upon our life to live a heavenly life right now is all the culture and society. It ain't going to be gone with the wind. And that wasn't much to go anyways. <laughs> Lamenting a culture of bondage and slavery and abuse of men. and Huh? Come on. Praise God that's gone. People still, some people are still living in that. The South's still rising again. What? Who wants it? People wanting to go back to the days of Thomas Jefferson. You don't want to go back to the days of Thomas Jefferson because you don't, look, my goodness gracious, unless you own land, you don't get to vote and you don't have basic rights. I mean, goodness, you and other, you, come on. Go read your history. Give me a break. Everybody's, you know, fantasizing about the past and it was, it, goodness. You want the future. Amen. We want what God asked for us in the future. <laughs> Father's bringing this thing to a joyous and glorious conclusion. Now, come on, man, I'm telling you, it's getting good. It's not getting bad. It's getting bad if you're assimilated. It's getting bad. Let me read this. I want, to, I want to read this. One last verse of verse, verse of scripture. Verse of verse. Kita sata tarate. Be happy. I'm, 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 I'm going to be happy and rejoice in the Lord. Amen. If there's no fig on the tree, if there's no calf in the stall, if there's no one, you know, fruit on the vine, no one making merry, oh, my, my, my. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Huh? Because I know in whom I have believed. Uh, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I'm going to live over here in this land. I'm, a, I'm not going to wait to die to go to heaven. I'm not going to wait to die to trust God. I'm going to go ahead and start right now. So that it's all perfectly set into place so that when I die, it may continue on where it's been established. Amen. For as a tree falleth, there it lies. And I mean, really, whatever, however you lived is how you're going to die. And however you die... Is how you're going to spend eternity. So in reality of it is how you live, is how, you, how you live now is how you're going to spend your life eternally. How valuable is that? I hope you get serious about your soul instead of your career, instead of your position in life, instead of bettering yourself, instead of your physical health or whatever else. There was a time in my life where people like, because I was doing, I was, in music and doing music and doing it and, and not doing it for the Lord and doing it for myself and, you know, and, and because I didn't want anybody, you know, looking at my own voice, I got a little weird and I just like, ah, when I sang. 
just to break it up so it's God. Lord Jesus, I love you. Huh? Because I just wanted, I wanted to get out of all of the personal issues. I mean, that's too weird. Don't do that. I was off. It didn't take long for me to get over that. Are you with me? But I mean, the honesty of the heart. I mean, where's the passion, the heart? Father, I really want this thing to be about you and not about me anymore. That's the point. How, how, does it, how do I begin to appropriate, appropriate this in every dimension of my life? How do I get real with myself? Because I don't even, the, the one thing I have going for me is I realized I didn't even know how to get real. I didn't know how to get real for myself, about myself, or really truly even understand anything about myself. I had that much insight. I read this little song, I wonder if I'm short or tall and just how far I'll have to fall before I can see what's there in front of me. Because that's really, dear people, we think we've got a clue, but we really don't, not when it comes to the, the reality of what's truly taking place around us. But Father wants us to open up our eyes and cause us to see. Hallelujah. That's only possible by the Holy Ghost. It's only possible in this relationship with the Lord. And you know what the love, you know what love is going to compel us to do? What is love going to compel us to do? To go. Love is going to compel us to go. You want to sing that song here in a minute? That's what love is going to do. Love is going to compel us to, do you think for a second that I would not die for my wife? Believe me. Believe me. Or for my children. Believe me. In an instant, in an instant, without question, without thought, with total abandonment. Love works. A love relationship works within us. The people that I'm closest to, clearly, I'm going to die for. I'll lay my life down for them without hesitation. I'll take, I'll, I'll stand between them and the charge and bear. Whatever. Jesus loved us that way when we were enemies. And he says, I want you to come and learn this. Wow. Lord. Enemies? Enemies? Yeah, I'll suffer, bleed, and die. I love you so much. I'm going to commend my love towards you. That while you're dead, dead and you trespass us in sin, God commended his love towards us. Now I want you to come and learn this. How do you learn this? Theoretically? Actively. Actively actively involved, going through the stuff, going through the rejection, going through the persecution, going through the hardship, going through the peril. I mean, there's been times, I'm telling you, there's been times that the enemy said, I got you now. I'm not kidding you. Have a vision, literally, of Satan getting ready to stop me and an angel come down out of heaven. I'm laid out, have a vision. I'm laid out on the ground and the powers of darkness about ready truly, truly to eat my head off. That was the whole picture. It was just gross and graphic. An angel comes down out from heaven and delivers me. I mean, have you been through that yet? Why don't you come join in? It's a little bit dramatic, but it's, you know what? The, 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 when the angels come and minister to you afterwards, it's worth it, as it were, right? He was tempted of the, it was, it was tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. Then the angels of the Lord came and ministered to him. Sweat, dra dra great drops of blood in this great, in distress over our soul and our lives, but then the angels come ministering. I mean, come on, just get in it. It's faith building, man. Because what's faith building? Because I was there at the point of death and God came and rescued me. I was once again about to be, lose it all and he came and supernaturally provided for me. I put God to the test. It's not theoretical, it's practical. It ain't going to happen outside of the practical application of sleeping with them, walking with them, eating with them, living with them, going everywhere with them, getting stoned with them, getting persecuted with them, getting, going to Calvary with them. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Don't miss out on this life. It's the secret to the overcomer. It's the secret to everything. I mean, my goodness, just a missionary, had been a missionary all of his life, looked at me and he said, Mark, let me tell you something. He said, when you go to reach the lost, you get God's attention. But when you go to the people who've never heard, he's standing up, staring at you. I mean, he's, he's, he's got his full attention. you got his eyes squinting and looking. People, I, I don't want you to miss out on that. I mean, 
I, we already have all God's favor in Christ Jesus. We do. There's, I'm not, there's nothing needs to be added to that. Anything added to that is sub-Christian. It's sub-reality. It's sub-truth. It's sub-new covenant. But obeying Father and being willing to go, look, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. That's Stephen being stoned. Come on. There's something there. Come on. Obeying Him. Obeying Him. And I, that's why I want to read this one last verse of Scripture to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Hallelujah. Say, Kara Satana ni ikiata. Say, Bakia niki ikiana de kia kitmoko. Say, Tata kana ikilama. Say, Tata kali in the mikiakata. Say, Yatakia ni ikiakata. Say, Tia katoko noko. See, I get to get in my ati. So I hear Japan calling me. I mean, I'm telling you. I look at a bunch of suffering people in prison that don't even know even the first step to take. Can you feel it? Can, 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 if you just get into this, man, it'll get real to you. You'll feel it. It'll pull on you. It'll cause you to weep. You won't have to try to cry about it. The compassions of Jesus Christ will fill you. I mean, Paul described it, these deep compassions that he felt deep in his whole being. And he called it, 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 like in the King James, he used a word that we can't even relate to, the bowels of compassion. You know, the deepest depths of movings of God. You know, it's just in you, man. It's just, it's a love that's just there, that, like you have for your kids. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, verse 3, and I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known by him. I love walking around reveling in the fact that he's engraved my name upon his, the palm of his hand. I love knowing that I'm family and nothing can change that. Ha! Ah, I love knowing that he knows me, that he personally has knowledge of my name and who I am. And that that compassion and that affection that he has that is expressed in the Bible is directed right at me. God wants every person on this planet, and especially you, to personally know that. There are a lot of things that run interference with that. And, and reality of it is, is what we're dealing with is the whole package of that to get it out of the way. So it can't run interference anymore with this knowledge. Hallelujah. When, there's no, when it's total abandonment to Him, when it's just total abandon, abandonment to Him, Satan can't run interference anymore. Situation stuff can't run interference anymore. It's just you and the Lord. <laughs> he that dwells in love dwells in God. This is where it's at. We're talking about relationship. We're talking about do it. If you love me, you will obey me. We're talking about this love relationship that Jesus showed us when He committed His love towards us when we were yet without when we were yet without strength, when we were yet ungodly, when we were yet enemies. If God's committed His love to us when we were enemies, how much more shall He now freely? If God spared not His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how much shall He not also freely give us all things by Him? I'm just, I want you to get into this. I want you to get into this. I want you to say goodbye to your careers tonight. I want you to say goodbye to your own life tonight. I want you to say goodbye to your own interest. I want you to have such a revival that you're just going to go sell your land and sell your houses and go ahead and put it into the kingdom of God. I want you to just throw all in. Father will take care of you. My mother used to say, look, if you throw all in for God and if He lets you down, I'll take up his slack. Look, you know, and the reality of it is that nobody's got to take up a slack. Because he's got none. He's got none. He has no slack. He's not slack concerning his promises. But is faithful towards us. Long-suffering towards us. Has enduring patience towards us. Not willing that any should perish. But that everybody should come to the knowledge of salvation. And I can't be selfish with that. And I can't be stingy with that. And I can't hold on to it and feel like I got my blessed assurance to you got yours. Sorry about you. No, that love will compel me to do something. That love will comp compel me to follow him, to go where he goes with total abandonment. Say, I'm yours, Lord. You got me. Whether I live or whether I die, we're going to go into the inheritance. Are you with me? 
How many Joshua's? How many Jacob? How many Joshua's? How many Caleb's? Where, where, whether we live or whether we die, we're going. We, we're we're going to leave it behind. Hey, how do you think it was for revival of leaving Babylon and going back to Jerusalem? That wasn't revival, praise God, yippee, we get to go back. They've already got their houses built and paid for. They've got the kids in school. They've got their jobs up and going. All their livelihood is built in Babylon. they got nothing back in the promised land. There's nothing but enemies waiting to kill them. There's no more vineyards. They've all been burned down. There's no more orchards. There's no more fruitful gardens. It's all a wasteland. What are we going back to? Come on now. The Lord's not asking of us any more than he asked of them. Still just the same thing that he did it with Adam. Still the same thing he did with Adam. I want you to absolutely trust me here. That's all he's doing with us. Same thing he did with Adam. I just want you to absolutely trust me here. Just do what I tell you. I just want you to absolutely trust me here. That's all he's doing. He's looking at you and going, sweet Ann. I just want you to absolutely trust me here. Every dimension of life is so beautiful, so wonderful. You know that the Lord designed us to get old and wrinkly. Kind of barely walk. He designed that. And it's beautiful, and you need to embrace every part of it. Every part of it. What's all going to go on there? What, what are we going to be? What are we going to be? When we get to that point, where, where are we going to be at? What are we going to be doing with our life? I mean, what we're doing now ultimately solidifies what we're going to be doing then. I mean, if we're going everywhere preaching the gospel now, then we're just going to be going everywhere preaching the gospel. It ain't nobody. I mean, come on. And how intense is it going to be when you're like, you know, 105 telling people about Jesus? <laughs> One eye's like this big, and the other eye's, you know. <laughs> You're, you know, almost dead. Come on, man. Come on now. Come on now. Delay no more. Tonight I'm asking you, in Christ's stead, delay no more. Tonight I'm asking you on behalf of the King of Kings, delay no more. Tonight I'm asking you on behalf of the Holy Ghost, define your entire life for the rest of your life in terms of of what we've been called to do in God, in Christ Jesus. Say goodbye to all the betterment of yourself, all your house plans, all your little whatever plans. Oh, come on now. God's got something bigger for you. This disciple said, but we left everything to follow you. He said, nobody's left everything to follow me except for I'll give them far more in this life and also in the life to come. And he named it out there. Come on, man. You try to get yours, it's going to be a prison to you. You give your life to have your own, it will be a prison to you. You give your life to obey Christ Jesus, and he'll give you things, alleluia, that'll just be a blessing. It'll be heaven. It won't be in the way. It won't rob you of your joy. It won't create fear and steal your peace at night. For the Lord makes wealthy and adds no sorrow to it. Thank you, Jesus.
Just lift your hands towards heaven. Father, we thank you for the baptism of fire. For the glory of heaven, we thank you for the baptism of fire. For the glory of heaven, baptize me. Lord, baptize me. In your glory now, in your fire now, Lord Jesus, in your glory now, in your fire now, Lord Jesus. Sakturi arara chi arara bekira topumaneng. In your fire, Lord Jesus, take my whole life. Let it be all arranged and ordered by you, Lord. Take my whole life. Everything I am, everything I am, arrange you, Lord. Order me. Command me, Lord. I will do what you ask of me. Take my life, oh God. I'll do whatever you ask of me. Take my life, oh Lord. Order me. Order me. Come and give me, oh God. I'll do whatever you ask. Arrange my life and order me. Just let your hands to heaven. Take my life, oh God, and order me. Command you me, oh God, I'll obey. Here I am, oh Lord Jesus. Here I am, oh God, my King. Here I am to serve you. 
Here I am, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you're our God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And here we are to worship. Here we are to bow. Here we are to say that you're our God. You're all together worthy, all together worthy, all together wonderful to us. Here we are to bow. Here we are to bow. Here we are to say that you're our God. You're all together worthy. All together worthy. All together wonderful to me. Lord Jesus Christ. Savior of our life, we worship you, Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of our life, we worship you, Lord. Let the fire of God fall on you now. Let the glory of heaven overwhelm you now. Say, Jesus, come baptize me. Say, I pour out my heart to you, Lord. Pour out my heart to you, Lord. To do your will, O oh God, is my desire. I pour out my heart to you, Lord. I pour out my heart to you, Lord. To do your will, O oh God, is my desire. I know every person in this place means this, and I want you to sing it with me. Because I know every person in this place, this is what you want. I know it. I pour out my heart to you. I pour out my heart to you. You're all that I desire, Lord. To do your will, O oh God, as I desire, I pour out my heart to you. I pour out my heart to you. To do your will, O oh God, as my desire, I yield my life to you. I yield my life to you. I yield my life to you. To do your will, O oh God, is my desire. I pour out my heart. I pour out my heart to you. I pour out my heart to you. To do your will, O oh God, is my desire. I yield my life to you. I yield my life to you. I yield my life to you. To do your will, O oh God, is my desire. I pour out. I pour out my life to you. I pour out my life to you. I fall down here 
before you, Lord. So blessed to be here now. To pour out all my desire. To take my heart and all I have and everything that's costly to me. And pour it out on you. To do your will, O oh God, is my desire. I pour out my life to you. I yield my life to you. I pour out my heart to you. To do your will is all that I desire. Pour out my heart to you. Father, we thank you that in your mercy tonight, you redefine for us how we're supposed to do things. Father, you help us to take the step. Father, we thank you that we know that in, you begin to order everything about our lives to bring everything into your divine order, and tonight we cooperate with that. Father, we know that for many people here tonight, the very first step that they can take is to just begin to order their life according to your divine order. To bring things into its proper place and setting and position in their life. To begin to get down on their knees and to begin to consecrate things to, to you, Lord, that is in their heart, every part of their being, so that you can begin to train them and develop them and help them to understand how to take the first steps of total abandonment to follow you. Father, I thank you that you'll take this church. You'll take the souls in this church and that there will be not a single person who's unable to understand exactly what your purpose and plan is for their life, that everyone will walk it out in Jesus' name. Dear people, dear saints of the Lord, here's what we want you to leave here tonight with. We want you to leave here tonight with the fact that God the absolute confidence and truth that Father loves you so dearly. We want you to live here, leave here tonight knowing without, a, without a question Father's consecration and commitment to you. We want you also to leave here tonight recognizing that you're going to have to beware and you're going to have to watch out because there's things that would try to spoil you. There's things that would try to deceive you. And the reality of it is, is total abandonment is what God calls for because total abandonment is what it's going to take. Those people here tonight who've been hurting inside, you just, you're in turmoil about your relationship with the Lord. I want you to receive peace. I have peace to give you and I want you to receive it tonight. I don't want you to be tossed to and fro. I don't want you to live in yesterday's defeat. I want you to live in today's release and freedom and acceptance. I want you to live in the now acceptance in Christ Jesus with a consecration to do it his way tomorrow for the rest of your life. The ordering of your life according to the commands of God is the best thing that could possibly happen to you. It's the best thing. It's life forevermore. It's life here now, and it's life in the, in the world to come. So I, I want to just invite anyone who's, who's, who just got hurts and pains and issues going on inside, and you're dealing with peace issues, perplexity issues. I want you to come right now. The Lord's going to touch you. I want you to come. It's come. There's a number of people that the, you know, the Lord's laid on my heart. Just come. <sighs> Let me tell you what happens to you when you get you you begin to get engaged in the things of the Spirit and the things of the ministry. You just want to do it every day, 24 hours a day. Just to begin to order your life. I mean, who said by you? Satan is a thief. He comes to try to steal all your time away from God. He's a thief. He's a liar. 
He's always running interference with the best thing going. And Father wants to take you aside into a secret place and begin to speak to you and build you up with confidence and boldness and certainty and show you things right out of heaven because nobody has anything unless he first receives it from heaven. The beautiful thing about it is his Father is constantly there to take care of us, to strengthen us, to establish us. He's there to wash away all the shame, to wash away all the sin, to wash away all the reproach, to just continually bathe us in His grace and His mercy. So long as we want it, so long as we want to be taught in the way, so long as we want to be led by the Holy Ghost, Papa's here, consecrated to us. It is hard to imagine how He's made us His servant, how He's began to wash our feet, how He's so consecrated to us. Now, you just turn everything over to the Lord tonight now. Now, don't you get in no battle. Don't you start trying to fix it all. Don't you get all upset about the problem that you created. Oh, pastor, you just got to say it like it is. Does he just, can't he, can he dilute it? Can't he find a better way to say it? <laughs> Father, I thank you for complete and total peace. Total restoration of every good thing. Thank you, Jesus. You know, when you walk around heaven for the first hour, it's got to be, I don't know, maybe for the first hundred years, how did I ever get here? Father is so amazing. So amazing. I believe that we're just going to be captivated and stuck on looking at his glory. We won't be able to move. You know why, why I believe that? Because I've seen dimensions of his glory. I haven't seen the fullness of his glory, but I've seen dimensions of his glory. And it's captivating. You don't want to move. Minutes turn into hours. Or rather, hours turn into minutes, I'm going to say. It's beautiful. Tonight, our whole call to you is to leave the earth and come into heaven. Our whole call to you is go get out of the prison, the stuff that you've combined yourself out. Get, get rid of the things that you've valued your life with, that you've defined as meaning. Any, any, anything in this, any dimension of life in this world is worthless. It's worthless. It's worthless. Paul used the right word, dung. It's worthless. Worthless. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I see Grandma coming into the kingdom. <laughs> you just walk in this love and walk in this peace now. Just walk in acceptance. Walk in acceptance. It's so sad that so many people have come into the kingdom and they've never really had a good model of a father. They've never had a father's love. But I'm going to tell you right now, you want to get a good model for a father's love, you have to look at how father interacted with Jesus and then just accept it as the way the father interacts with you too many sons have had fathers just way too hard on them too rough with them show them affection and hug them didn't love them he's going to have to get past that father I thank you for the mercy and the miracle that helps every person get past that by your wonderful act of revelation of who you are to each person. Let your glory overwhelm every heart in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Bakatea no Bakatea no sapat. Bakatea la mai. Bakatea la masatea. Belena. Berekatea. Berekatea la masatea. Ritiki on the mouth. She kingly. She came out. <laughs> she came out. Hale sutai. Exi to my esi apro.
mia tekaya. Maina. <laughs> Maina. You know, listen, Brad, I just heard the Spirit of the Lord say, saying, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Tell them, I paid the devil. I paid the devil. The devil for their sin. The devil, the devil for their transgression. It is amazing how freely the Lord has loved us. And I, 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 there's no question about it. The very first step of moving into these things in God just knowing, believing the love the Father has for us. Just getting so comfortable and so bold there. So built up there. So confident there. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord is not hard on us or demanding. He just wanting to break us free from everything, every attachment in the world. He's just calling us completely out of one realm into another realm so that we can enjoy everything that he wants to give us that otherwise would be, you know, it would be stopped. It'd be held back from us. It'd be prevented. It'd be hindered. Father just wants, I mean, here's what Father wants. He wants us to have abundant life. And then he tells us, this is what you got to have. To, this is what's got to happen for you to have it. You gotta break, you gotta break all the attachments with the world. And that's not very difficult, people. It's not really. It came real easy to me. I saw it come real easy to Jesus. It didn't seem too difficult or too hard for Paul. Take my life. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Hallelujah. Let them flow in sea. I mean, think about that. How good is that? How, how good is it to, to think of being able to, hallelujah, live out a life, to be able to pine all day long, just cease praise and thanksgiving over being overwhelmed with the goodness of God. All the things that are in this world, all the things that we all hold value that that is in this world have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Stop that. Plug that up. Thank you, Jesus, for the anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You got the wrong shirt on. Your shirt says mellow out. It needs to, be, it needs to say get fired up. You need to have a marshmallow on fire. We need to redo that shirt. <laughs> In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everything changes in Jesus' name. Everything changes. People are having struggles trying to figure out what to do with their life. And the whole reason being is because You're thinking about the wrong things. You've got the wrong choices in front of you. This is microphone. Here, turn that one on. Because you got the wrong choices in front of you. A, B, C, D doesn't look good because they all the wrong choices. A, B, C, and D.
Now you listen to me. In Jesus' name, you listen to me. You know, the microphone was doing so well tonight. The sound was best ever. And we appreciate that. Just try to hold it together for the last five minutes. <laughs> Jonathan, you're going to blow it if you try to pursue your own life. It's, gonna, it's not going to work out. So let's just go ahead and make a commitment tonight that it's over for you, pursuing your own life. You're off the hook, buddy. You do not have to be successful in this world. You're off the hook. You do not have to go and create a prison for yourself to live in. Aren't you blessed? You don't have to confine yourself to a, a, a millstone grinding meal for the system of the world day in, day out. To stay for in Jesus' name, you're free to go ahead and follow Jesus now. It'd be far better free to go to Bible school than any other school. Just forget about the rest of the stuff. You don't need it. You don't need it. The wisdom of this world is just foolishness to God. Let the Lord provide for you. Let him provide for you now. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy and your grace. Hallelujah. Nangdek siko in daike. Mumbru se yaratikshi. Eju jadaba ahi. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That you wash us, that you cleanse us, that you fill us up, that you flood our souls with your glory. That you give us everything that's good, everything that pertains to life and godliness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your peace. Right now, I give you peace. From the crown of the head, so is your feet. I tell you, holiness unto the Lord. Just worship the Lord. Just, I mean, that His glory fills this house right now. It's, just worship Him. Just, just praise Him. Just, hallelujah. God, I'll sit in the morning. Just stand in awe of Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ella Satea. Is a Bakina kiss. Is a Bakia Niki Kishia. Receive right now, in Jesus' name. Receive right now, in Jesus' name. 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 In Jesus' name. Seke na moki kia te eki. Saboki na kaya. Saberanaya. Sukatoshi presiti na mai. Sibera sikin na loku sipiki na keki na mokatai. And Father, I thank you for strengthening this body to run in the power of the Holy Ghost, to run in the power of your anointing for the remainder of her life. Father, I thank you for this great work of grace. Hallelujah. Habasate. I thank you, Father, for the great things that faith is going to do. Faith does great things. Did you know that? Faith does great things in the kingdom. Sikaratast. <laughs> Sicara dust, sicara dust, sisti prai, si mesti. 
Father, thank you for such boldness and confidence and rest and acceptance in the beloved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bodos takain and messia titea. Ovre vekin and amanda de defe inese etala de koya. Herestana meo. Hallelujah. Herestana meo, si pretea. Ha. Ha. Bombra seit. Bombra sete. Bombra sete. Bombra sete. Bombra seteo. Bombra seteo. Bombra sete. Stola make. Can you see if you turn this? Sibembra secura staya. Meleng de seprete kusht. Libi revana bexti. Membrane de bacalosa paya. Ibreve kutara namandalia pataya. Surish de brini. Libanda la cosi protost. Sibambra vekis de perfetis. Si bambra si gibre de te. I can just hear, I can hear praying. I can hear praying going on in heaven. And I know that the Lord allows me to hear those things because it's what's going on in heaven that he wants to go be going, have going on in earth. And, I, and it's, these, it's these passionate, it's these passionate cries. It, it's, not, it's not as it were, it's not where it is, it were desperate cries, but it's this deep longing and Expressions of love and praise. It's all kind of blended together in a, in a cry to be used of God and for His will to be done in the earth. It's a faith cry of a deep love and affection. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll be able to hear it. You'll be able to, you'll be able to respond to that cry of the Spirit, crying the longings of the Holy Ghost, the deep longings of the Holy Spirit. Deep longings. He prays with he prays making intercession with longings which cannot be uttered. But oh when that begins to turn into a song of love, an intimate cry and praise unto heaven. See, there's a lot of stuff that clouds the that clouds the atmospheres of your life, the interest, the issues, the circumstances, the situations. I know that the transition that's got to take place, it, when it takes place, you're, you're never going to be on one day and off the next day. Just you're going to be constantly in this wonderful place of intimacy with Him. Just, just let it happen. Just let it happen. Just let the Lord Jesus happen to you. Let the prayer and the cries of the, of the Spirit 
of, oh, thy will be done in my life, oh God. Let those things happen to you. But they're, they're, understand that, understand that some of it can happen tonight. But more than anything else, things get birthed in services like tonight to ultimately begin to be expressed and, and lived out and developed in every dimension of your life. I love you, Lord Jesus. I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go for you. Send me this day, Lord. It becomes far more than just a passive prayer or even almost seeming like the, you know, the hollow sound of prayer. There's some deep affection and love that's being expressed when we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. Oh, it's captivating to the world. It's captivating to the church. It's captivating. I want you to come and learn of this thing. I want you to come learn what I'm talking about. I want you to come and learn about it. I want you to come to know it. Sikaramatakise. Just let your hands towards heaven, baby. Just close your eyes. Let your hands towards heaven. Don't look at brother. Look at Jesus. There's some, there's things that, there's things that the Lord wants to hear you talk to him about. I, be, there's people, I think they believe God's telepathic. Well, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not going to put in, limit God in any way, but I don't know what he wants to do is he wants to hear what's coming out of your mouth, the cries of your heart. Words are very important to the, to the Lord. The calls unto the Lord, and it, and it, and it you know, and it, it's time that the calls are just expressions of deep love and affection. I mean, repentance is good. But how about when the prayer becomes deep expressions of love and affection? How about if you tonight would have let the Spirit of the living God show you how that the Holy Ghost would make intercession through you? How that the Spirit of the Son would begin to cry, Abba, Father, through you? How that a fountain, a flow would begin to come through your life that has absolutely no mixture of affection in this world. But it's just a pure love expression for the Father. Just a pure love expression. Huh? Not, not a sense of abandonment or, or hurt or rejection or neglect or anguish but just a pure, deep, loving sound of affection. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that every person in this place would come to such peace in God that there is no condemnation, that there is no sense of separation, that every person in this place would be so filled with the Spirit that boldness and confidence would be your stability. That you'd be so overwhelmed in your fellowship and your walk with love that the expressions are not tough strains anymore of anguish or uncertainties. But deep expressions of affection, of love towards the Father and praise. Of, oh God, your will be done. 
I pray in the name of Jesus that every person in this place comes to know what it means to really praise Him in the Spirit. To worship Him in spirit. To worship Him, in, in other words, by the Holy Ghost. Just listen to me. Just listen to me. Because there is a human realm and I'm, I'm okay understanding that so many people have just got to start in the human realm. I understand that. But we want to develop you out of it real quick. And we can show you, because Christ Jesus is, we've received these things from heaven. We can show you. We can help you. That's what we're here to do. And just the first and foremost thing is that you find your place of being loved by Him. The Lord wants, you, the Lord wants to love on you. The Lord Jesus wants to love on you. When he begins to love on you, you're never going to be unhappy and perplexed again. When you begin to let him love on you, you're going to have a boldness and a confidence. <laughs> when these things begin to happen in your life or this fellowship where you know, where you know that you're known by him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Psalm 38, verse 9 says, Lord, all my desires are before thee. Mm -hmm. Let him be all you desire. Holy Spirit, we look to you right now because this mercy and this grace we recognize comes from you. And Lord, we know that you've not withheld as you've given liberally. Father, you know the dynamics of all the things that would try to plug up this glorious flow, try to hinder this development and growth. Father, we ask in your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness that this beautiful light of relationship that the world is in desperate need of seeing will be given witness and testimony in this place to the people that are in this place. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that folks don't just immediately leave here and go start talking about whatever it is in their careers that they're so excited about or whatever it is that has been of interest to them up to this point that deprives them of this rich flow of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. But Father, every person in this place can begin to have an expression, Holy Spirit, that is only possible in you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, before you, I don't want anybody to get up or move. I mean, I want you to just go in deep and just to worship. I want you to go in, I want you to learn how to worship. I've wanted to do a school of worship, but usually it's just basically trying to fix the sound system. And we're believing God to be able to get rid of all of that stuff and, you know, do something that's far more simple. It doesn't, it's not so complicated. I can control it from the pulpit on my iPad because the technology is there now. Um, but I mean, just, you know, and I could do that school of worship, and, but it's still going to take people being willing to take what they learn and what they receive and begin to apply it in their heart, in their life. A deep love and affection for the Lord is something that you either have or you don't have, and you're supposed to get it when you're born of God. But I know that the world will take it away and drown it 
with all of its interest. So if, if you're willing to consecrate yourself to the Lord and push all that stuff aside and let your life be defined in Him, there's no more hindrance anymore. And now you get to have these be this beautiful flow of heaven. That is a unique sound. You hear there's a unique sound. It's a unique sound. Those who have it, there's a unique sound. There's something unique about them. Something attractive. It's for everyone. It's the spirit of the Son crying out the Father. It's what it is. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, I pray for the miracle that happened to you. I pray for, the, pray for the miracle of all prayer and supplication and giving of thanks in and by the Holy Ghost. Beautiful. Right? In and by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' name, your life is totally radically changed, caught up in glory. And when you're caught up in glory, you pray different. The affection is different. The sound of it's different. The expression of it's different. Father wants this for every single one of his people everywhere. And we pray that you'll have it right here. And it'll grow and it'll develop and increase. There's such a beautiful display of heaven for all San Diego to see wherever the Lord sent you. <laughs> Amen. So before you leave here tonight, we want you to worship the Lord with your giving. I want you to just reach into the heaven and say, Lord, just show me how to move in faith, to be able to give more, to move in faith, to be able to receive more from heaven, to participate more. We're getting ready to build a stage out here. We need a lot of help. There's extra finances that we need for it. We're getting ready to deal, do the lighting. We're going to try to get all of that done this next week, in fact. So we, once again, your, your willingness to be on your face before the Lord and praying, crying out to the Lord concerning the breakthrough and the ministry and the move of the Spirit and the impact of these meetings upon people's lives. It's so necessary, so important. Amen. 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 Your prayers can turn to other people's salvation. If prayer was something that is a minor Christian thing or whatever, some, just something for people who don't know the Lord very well or whatever, Jesus went and dedicated himself so much to it. Prayers, the power and the authority and the effectiveness of prayer is expressed and highlighted in the fact that Jesus went away to do it all night in preparation of the ministry the next day. What a Jesus. What a man of God he was <laughs> and is. And I pray you'll be just like him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> we love you.